This is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. It's Wednesday, November 15th. Um, call to order. I would like to invite uh, uh, Scarborough's Boy Scout Troop number 39 to the front to lead us in the, the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd join us, uh, men, up front. Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to be uh, hearing a presentation from uh, uh, Eagle Scout candidate uh, Luke Thatcher and his troop uh, a little bit later, but to move into uh, roll call first. Councilor Donovan? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Baba? Here. And just for the record, uh, Councilor St. Clair is feeling under the weather and couldn't make it today, so we wish her well. Um, moving into general public comments, um, if you would like to get up and speak, you have three minutes. Please state your name and address or the city in which you live in, and you have three minutes. My name is Jean Marie Katarina, and I live at 311 Gorham Road. I just would like to uh, extend my appreciation to the people of Scarborough for recently returning me to the town council. I'm looking forward to uh, sitting up there instead of back here starting December 6th. Um, I would also like to thank, uh, excuse me, thank uh, Councilor St. Clair. I'm sure, sorry she's not here tonight. Um, she gave five years of her life to service uh, on the town council. I'd like to thank her for, for her time. I'd also like to thank Tody and Tracy for running a fabulous election, as always. Um, having been an election worker myself for a number of years, I know all of the uh, effort that goes into that, and I'd like to thank them for that. And last, but certainly not least, thank you to uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Babine, for uh, leading the council for the past year. I know it's not an easy job, but um, hey, you made it through. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Very few scars. <laughs> My name is Mike Doyle. I own Falmouth Today. Me. I live in uh, Falmouth on Shady Lane. Uh, I wanted to uh, make an announcement that Scarborough made the national radio news this morning about their uh, application to be the site for the Amazon complex. The reporter had to uh, try to uh, keep from laughing about it because he mentioned the uh, Scarborough racetrack as the p proposed site. Uh, if it was a serious application, it probably made uh, Scarborough the laughing stock of the United States. Uh, Dallas, Texas, or Scarborough, Maine. 50,000 people moving to the Scarborough, Maine, Greater Portland area, or 50,000 people moving to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. 7.5% uh, income tax in the state of Maine, zero income tax in Texas. You have to wonder where they're going to be. But on a more serious note, uh, Tommy Hall was a little uh, petulant and childlike at the election uh, site recently. And I said I was going to move him up on my radar screen. And no sooner did I say that, he said, well, am I not on your radar screen already? He said, no, I'm going to move you up to a higher level. And with an hour of that, a person came up to me and said, you know, Tommy Hall got almost fired from Rockland. He fled there just in time to get a job here. And they said there was some kind of corruption Doyle. involved Doyle. with piping Mr. Doyle. contracts, piping Doyle. contracts in Rockland. No, I don't have to. I have yes, three minutes. Do. I have three minutes, sir. No, Mr. I have three minutes. I'm going to dig you. into it and see what's going on in Rockland Doyle, that, please caused, leave the room. that caused you to please flee there leave the room, here. sir. Please leave the room. Don't have to. Uh, I have freedom of speech even here. They asked you to leave the room, sir. You're going to have to arrest me. You want to arrest me? I do not want to arrest you. Well, you're going to have to arrest me because I have freedom of speech in this building. Okay, well, they've asked you to leave. So please gather your things. No. So let's gather your things. Not, you don't need the to answer is still no. Okay, well, let's have an arrest. Come on. Finally, that's fine. Huh? And we'll ask what you have to do. Sorry. 
Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks, it's part of the job, but um, is there anybody else I would like to get up and speak? <laughs> Good evening. Um, it's my hope by now that most of you can agree that there are changes or amendments needed on certain aspects of the sign ordinance. Not only has the new sign ordinance been difficult for most to understand, but it has also proven difficult to be understood and is confusing by even some of those who wrote and or approved these changes. That's great that signs are being followed up on, but only after being reported. I'm sure it's not at the top of the town clerk's or the zoning administrator's list to pull over to the side of the road to check every sign for every detail listed that it should have. I realize time is needed to identify and contact those not in compliance, but if there are rules, they must be consistent enforcement. Because there could be possible perception issues with public trust if certain businesses are allowed their illegal sign when others are warned. The same goes with all political candidates. The same goes with several businesses that are along Route 1 that have two to four banner signs when the new ordinance states only one per business. I think this is one part of the ordinance that someone needs to lighten up on and allow at least two. There is a part of the local ordinance calling for an address on the sign, but for enforcement purposes, I guess, if a sign has a web address, then that is deemed accept acceptable. Well, then, in my opinion, the ordinance needs to be written that way. I know several realtors, and they don't know what to think. Do they need all this information on a simple stick in the ground sign that says home for sale? Another part of the ordinance that is a problem is the name of the person who planted the sign. Well, I think it's safe to say that no one followed that one. That needs to go. If the name of the person on the sign is sufficient, then the ordinance needs to be written that way. And what does one contiguous sign mean to a citizen running for office or a group with said agenda? Does it mean that one, in fact, can have two signs tacked together, both bearing the same or different message, and then it is deemed one sign? I know of one group that would love to know the correct definition for future reference. Also needed, in my opinion, is what happens to any said group or individual if they leave their sign up for more than a week past said event. Whether it is an election, a fundraiser, or a yard sale, there should be a provision for perhaps a fine for each sign each day a sign is left up past its stated purpose. You never know, it could be a good revenue source. There are a couple improvements with the sign ordinance and the easiest to understand that I would like to applaud. The one banning signs along the marsh and preserve areas, and the one not allowing signs with same or similar message closer than 30 feet to one another. I really hope that consideration is given to these items I've listed and more, just to lighten up a little. Perhaps, too, that on the political level, to maybe just make the local ordinance the same as the state one. Wouldn't that make things easier on most everyone involved? If you think this election season was busy with infractions to all those new items, just wait until next year when the governor's race gets going in addition to the state and local races. Just in time. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, I've spoken several times about the ordinance here and in other venues. Uh, I'd like to say there some good things about the sign ordinance. Uh, it was nice that, that we didn't have them in the marsh, we didn't have them in sensitive areas. I think that's certainly a plus. I think around our major intersections, it was nice not to have the proliferation of signs that we have had in the past. Um, I think, however, there are areas of the ordinance that can be revisited. I'm just going to touch on a couple of these tonight. Uh, one is uh, just mentioned was the banner signs. We have many businesses on Route 1 and on Payne Road that have more than one banner sign. Uh, these folks are, are trying to make a living, and I, as a, 
a citizen, I don't see a problem with them having two, three, or four, and many of them do. So I would like to see, you know, a consideration on changing that as opposed to uh, continuing the, with a prohibition on it. Also, on the right turn only lanes, currently our signs at the intersection must be 30 feet back from the intersections. But corners where we have a right turn only lane, uh, the 30 feet is from the beginning of the right turn lane. And we have light right turn lanes that are 100 feet, 120 feet long, and the sign goes back another 30 feet from there. I don't see, uh, I'd like to see consistency and have it 30 feet from the corner, whether that's a right turn only or right turn and straight through the intersection. Um, it was just touched upon about the state elections and the primaries. Uh, we have candidates in our, our town that uh, overlap with other communities, have different, and they have state standards that they're going by here in this town when they plant signs. Apparently, they'll have to, you know, abide by ours. We also have uh, statewide elections, as she uh, mentioned, uh, for governor and other races, and you have the same uh, potential problem this summer on that. Um, on another matter, um, on these signs, on the, on the signs, Everyone is supposed to follow the rules here, and certainly elected officials should be held to at least the same standard as um, citizens. And, and uh, we've had instances where two signs, alike signs, were put side by side. We have instances where uh, signs on private property were two signs where the ordinance uh, states one. If anyone should understand what the ordinance means, Certainly the folks sitting at this, this table should. Uh, it's been addressed uh, through proper channels uh, at the town level. Uh, it's been identified by uh, the person in charge that one of those two signs should, be, should have been removed. Uh, it was not removed. Um, I emailed uh, the ordinance committee after the last town uh, meeting and uh, let those three members know about this. And uh, here it is, the 15th, and I've not heard back on, on definitely what's, what's occurred or what's going to be allowed next season. So I think that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Anybody else I would like to speak? Not seeing any, I'm going to close the general public comments. Moving on to item number five, which are the minutes. Uh, motion to approve the minutes for November 1st, 2017. Is there a motion from so council? Second. There's... Any edits, corrections, or modifications for the town clerk? Mm -hmm. Not seeing any. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, there are no items, um, adjustments to today's agenda. I have already taken care of the treasurer's warrants and they have been signed. Moving into item number eight, a non-action item. We are here for a presentation from Luke Thatcher, who is with uh, Boy Scout Troop 39 on his Eagle Scout project. So I'd like to turn the podium to, uh, over to Mr. Thatcher. And I probably should move. <clears throat> So before I start, I'd just like to thank all the members of the council for inviting me to uh, give this presentation tonight. Uh, my name is Luke Thatcher. I'm an Eagle Scout with Troop 39. I'll be presenting on my Eagle Scout project, which I restored the Larrabee Cemetery um, in northern Scarborough. This is just where it is on the map. Um, it's right near the intersection of Beach Ridge and 114. This is a picture I took from Google Maps. Um, when I was done with the project, I actually had the cemetery added onto Google Maps. So um, if you look it up on there, it'll show up now just to make it easier to find. This is the state of the cemetery before we started doing any work to it. Um, it looks like it had been abandoned for quite a long time. The stones were all knocked over. They were overgrown. Uh, there were a few fallen trees in the cemetery. Here's another view of it. You can see more fallen over stones. Uh, the stones in the back are from, I think it was 1820s, and the one fallen over near the front here from early 1900s, so they've been abandoned for quite a while. Here's another view of the fallen tree. And right in front of that big headstone right there that says Larrabee, that was actually dug up 
um, or maybe it was a sinkhole or something, but either way, there was a pit in front of that stone that we had to be filled. This is the view from Ottawa Woods Road before we started. You can't even really see that the cemetery's in there at all, so most people didn't really know it existed. Um, this is where we later built a path as part of the project so you can get in there. So this is that same view again. We went in and we started cutting all branches off the trees, um, breaking up the ground, stuff like that, just to make it easier to get in. We had some people in the cemetery scrubbing off the stones uh, just to clean them up before we did any repair work. So you can see they're scrubbing off all the algae there. <coughs> Once we cleared out the path, we got some two by fours, they're pressure treated, line those out where the path is gonna go. Right here, uh, we're fixing one of the fallen stones. So we, once we cleaned it up, we leveled the base on the ground so it would stand upright. We had some pieces of rebar to support it and we cemented it in place. So now th that stone's sturdy and it's not gonna fall over again. Until the algae and stuff was scraped off, we took washcloths and buckets of water to get some more of the dirt off, just to clean the stones a little bit more. Uh, this is back to the path again. We had a liner underneath it so that plants don't go through, so it's, it'll probably last uh, a long time. Um, we we're just putting in a support um, going between the sides of the path uh, so it'll stay in place. Once that was all done, we filled it in with some crushed stone just to make it easier to walk on, make it look nice. Um, and you can see at this stage, uh, it's a nice path all the way into the cemetery, so it's a lot easier to get in there than when we started. Right here, we were fixing some of the footstones, which all the stones earlier than, I think it was a date like 1920 or 1900, something like that. Anytime before that, headstones used to also have footstones that went with them. Um, so most of the stones in the cemetery, since it's so old, had these, and a lot of them were buried under the ground um, and they were missing, so we went and found those somewhere in the cemetery and we put them back with their respective headstones. This headstone right here, uh, we didn't really know it existed before we started because it was buried by dirt and leaves and stuff. So once we uncovered it, we found it was in four pieces. Uh, we took some angle iron, stuck it in the ground, cemented all the pieces together, and then we clamped it, um, let all the cement dry. So at this point, this stone's actually more sturdy than any other one in the cemetery because of um, all the supports and stuff it has, so that one's up right now. Once we were done with everything in the cemetery, I had a sign made by Sinorama and Sako, and we put that at the edge of the trail, so you can see that from the road now, just so you know that the cemetery's in there. So that's the final view from the path. And that's the final view from inside the cemetery. Another view. By the time we were finished, I think we repaired a total of 14 headstones. Um, there were only four that were standing up when we started, so now all 18 of them are upright and they're secure. Here's just a before and after picture. Uh, we went back to the cemetery um, I think it was last weekend for Veterans Day, and we, we raked it up because after the storm a couple weeks ago with the power outages and everything, it was filled with leaves and sticks again, so we cleaned that up. On the left side, uh, there's Dr. Chase in his Civil War uniform. He's sitting in the audience <laughs> right now. Um, so once we cleaned it up, we did a graveside dedication. So we put flags for Captain Daniel Larrabee from the War of 1812 and Captain, I think it's John Larrabee from the Civil War, just to identify that we have veterans buried there. And then one more time, I'll just go back to the before and after picture. Anyone have any questions about anything we did? Well, first I'd like to say thank you. That is a, that's a tremendous job. That's a, um, that looks like a lot of work, and uh, we really appreciate you having done it. Thank you. Um, that's amazing. But what, um, just curious, where did you get the idea? Like, what, what led you to, to do this? Well, some of my neighbors had told me that the cemetery was in there because obviously you couldn't really see it when, before we started. So we went in, um, saw it was really bad shape. Um, I just decided it would be good for an Eagle project because it needed to be fixed up anyway. So I just contacted the Historical Society that gave me some information and just got to work. Perfect. And what was the, um, 
like what was the oldest stone that you saw that was in there? I think the date was 1823. But those stones had been replaced at some point, so the oldest stone was probably late 1800s. Did you, did you need any special permission to work on a cemetery? The cemetery is on private property, so I got the permission of the landowners. Um, and they gave me permission to have the pass, so there's public access to it and everything. So um, a couple of quick questions. How did, you, how did you know how many headstones were there if they were all buried? Did you get that from the Historical Society? We didn't know at the beginning. As we worked, the scope of the project just kept getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we kept discovering headstones that were buried and more that needed to be repaired. Uh, but by the end, since we had everything cleaned up, we could see that there were no more headstones buried. We had everything all cleared out of there, so we know they're 18. And, and is it only Larrabee family in there, or are there others out that were outside, do you know? It's mostly Larrabee. There's also some from the Libby family, which married into the Larrabee family at some point. Mm -hmm. And then the one that you saw with the angle iron, which is in the bottom of that picture on the bottom right, uh, his name is William Fives, so he's not actually related, but we think he was a former husband of one of the Libbies who was married to Larrabee, so he's like kind of distantly related. Great job. Sure. Great job. Yeah, great That's job. Important. Oh. So uh, I did want to just extend. I think there, there's some point in time where if there's a, uh, a military veteran, the town's actually obligated to maintain these cemeteries. I don't know what the actual year is, but I, like that's. I'm uh, sure it's after 1820. I'm sure it's actually after 1823. <laughs> so thank you again. Excellent job. Thank you. Uh, moving on to order number 17-006. Um, I apologize to the manager. We'll be right back. Um, resolution 17-006, an act on the request to approve resolution 17-006, recognizing Saturday, November 25th, 2017, as Small Business Saturday. Is there anybody that would like to speak on that item from the public? Not seeing any, because I have a feeling everyone's getting up not to talk about Small Business Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys very much. With that, I will close the public comments. And um, in the form of a motion, I'll read the resolution and ask for a second. Resolution 17-006, recognizing November 25th, 2017, as Small Business Saturday. Be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, and Town Council assembled that whereas the government of Scarborough, Maine celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community. According to the United States Small Business Administration, there are currently 28.8 .8 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all businesses with employees in the United States, are responsible for 63% of net new jobs created over the past 20 years. And whereas small businesses employ 48% of the employees in the private sector in the United States, and whereas on average 33% of consumers' holiday shopping will be done at small independently owned retailers and restaurants, and whereas 91% of all consumers believe that supporting small independently owned restaurants and bars is important, and whereas 76% of all consumers plan to go to one or more small businesses as part of their holiday shopping, and whereas Scarborough, Maine supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy, and preserve our neighborhoods, and whereas advocacy groups as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Scarborough Town Council proclaims November 26, 2017, Small Business Saturday in Scarborough, Maine, and urges the residents of our community and communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. Signed and dated this 15th day of November 2017 on behalf of the Scarborough Town Council and then the Town Manager of Scarborough, Maine. Is there a second? Second. Comments and questions? Councillor Chiazzo. Um, I perfectly support this. I did just notice a typo, though, at the bottom. Got it. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that any other comments? This is something that uh, we have historically and traditionally supported. Um, it is a, a growing part of our community, as we know. Um, if you just look at what is around us, it's imp uh, very important. So I appreciate the support from the council, as we have always supported small businesses. Uh, with that, if there's no other questions or comments, um, move the question. All in favor? 
and that is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to um, old business, order number 17-80 act to create an ad hoc budget advisory committee tabled from the September 20th, 2017 town council meeting. I'd like to open that up to any comments from the public. Is anybody that would like to speak on this? Not seeing any, we close the public comment. And um, the, I believe if I'm acting properly within Robert's rules, because this was tabled, um, there's already a motion and a second to approve the original ad hoc budget advisory resolution that was submitted to us. Um, and so that there does not need to be a motion or a second because it's already part of the original um, conversation. Is there any conversation or any more comments or questions regarding this? I'd like to make a motion to amend. Absolutely. Okay, so um, we were able to convene uh, the school board and the entire town council to get together for a workshop, which I thought was uh, really a fantastic conversation uh, and talk about, you know, how do we, uh, and it's not even so much about improving the process as, as it is bringing more people into the process, I guess. At least that's the way I view the conversation and where it went. So um, I'm going to go ahead and read the amendment. I'm, I'm going to, well, I'll just go through it, right? Okay. Um, so the ad hoc budget support committee, be it resolved by the council of the town of Scarborough, Maine, and town council assembled that, whereas the town and school budgets affect every person in the town of Scarborough, and whereas the school budget validation vote has failed with the voters of Scarborough repeated, repeatedly in recent years, and whereas residents have been clear in their interest to better understand the process used to generate town and school budgets and in their desire to have clearer channels to communicate with the town council regarding budgets, and whereas the town council form of government is a representational form of government that allows for citizen advisory groups to inform its decision making, and whereas in an, in an effort to identify strategies for improving communications and outreach regarding the budget process and to create an opportunity for a diverse citizen group to report to the council on a balanced approach to meet the above mentioned challenges, now therefore be it resolved by the Scarborough Town Council in Town Council Assembled that there is hereby an ad hoc budget support committee created and the membership terms, offices and duties shall be as follows. Number one, purpose. The purpose of the budget support committee is to work with and support the town manager and the town council on strategies to promote better community understanding of the budget processes and support greater acceptance of results of the annual budget process shown by a positive school budget validation vote. The committee will help implement and support improvements to the budget process as identified by the Town Council and Board of Education. In, in addition, the committee may propose their ideas as well uh, as identifying additional communication and outreach opportunities. The following is a general overview of the discussion points, expectations, and deliverables that the committee should consider while doing its work. Uh, establish a baseline of facts regarding the costs associated with delivery of current and historical service levels by benchmarking Scarborough's costs to those in other communities through available data sets. Information developed would of course need to, to meet the Joint Finance Committee's approval before publication. Identify common goals among all Scarborough stakeholders. Consider ways to improve the way in which the current budget gets shared and communicated to the broader community. Develop suggested outreach and communication strategies. The committee would also be charged with finding ways to support the ideas from the Board of Education and Town Council Joint Workshop once consensus and agreement has been reached on which items to pursue. There is a whole host of bullets here that I'm not going to read into the record at this time because it's at this point just a conversation and hasn't been uh, fully embraced by either of those entities. Um, but we'll go down to number two. Um, Membership, the membership intends to provide fair representation of key stakeholders across age, income and duration of residency demographics. Members should be sought out who have experience in budgeting, public policy and community engagement. The committee shall be limited to Scarborough residents and comprised of nine members as follows. Two town councilors, two school board members and five additional at-large members to be selected through an open application process. The goal would be to attract a diverse group of volunteers representative of differing demographics like age, income, education, and geographic areas of town. Appointments would be made by the town manager and superintendent. 
Although official membership is limited to members, the committee would be encouraged to draw upon other resources and invite other key stakeholders to participate in their proceedings as they feel appropriate. Time frame: the committee shall meet and report their identified goals and agreed upon deliverables to the town council by the first town council meeting held in February. Upon acceptance and approval by the council, the committee will shift its focus to meeting the goals and deliverables by continuing to meet, support, and implement the identified activities, events, and outreach throughout the budget season, culminating with the June referendum. The committee's work will terminate after the June referendum unless deemed appropriate to, be, to continue or agreed by both the Board of Education and Town Council to be put in place for subsequent budget seasons based on feedback and effectiveness. That was in the form of a motion. Is there a second to the amendment? For purposes of discussion, I'll second the motion. Um, any conversation? Councilor? Yep. So, again, I think um, what I tried to do is I just have a firm belief that, and not just last budget season, if we look back at the last decade, um, when none of us were, while well, some of us were sitting at this table, mm -hmm. uh, probably <laughs> in that time frame, um, we have a history of not passing our school budget. And that just says to me that we've got to look at some different ways of doing things. And the idea of, um, you know, getting people involved uh, creates what I think is engagement and a, a certain ownership. Um, and that would be, that's kind of my goal uh, in proposing to uh, put this committee together. I do recognize that this is um, very substantive changes from the very first proposal that was put out there. Uh, and because of that, there may not have been time for a lot of public consumption. Um, so I, I just would like to hear people's initial reactions to it, thoughts, and where they are feeling about it right now, uh, and, where, and then decide where we would take it from here, if anywhere. So I do think the, the public safety committee that was formed was a great model of collaboration and created leverage that, you know, eventually got the, that project passed. And, I, and I've been looking to kind of model after that. So there you go. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate the, uh, the intention with which, from which this is coming. I, I'm, I, um, I'm wholly supportive of um, fostering further um, dialogue with the public around the, the budget process. I'm just, I'm really concerned with the, um, with the way in which we're executing this. Um, I feel like we have, um, uh, this is a single action um, item, um, and you're, you're bringing this forward to be acted on and decided on um, somewhat unilaterally. Um, I just feel like there hasn't been a lot of um, discussion and buy-in and consensus building around it. And I'm just really concerned that we're really asking for um, a lot of bad policy if we use this as a precedent for how we want to make um, important decisions as a town. I, I think I'm, I'm firmly on the side that um, there's a, a way to do this, but I, I just I feel like this is not uh, the right way to do it. Other comments, Council Chiazzo? Um Yeah, I, 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 it's no secret I, I really wasn't in favor of this from the get-go. Um, I, I, for similar reasons to what Councilor Rowan has expressed, um, I, I don't I don't see the changes that were made that are really reflective of the joint uh, meeting that we held. I, I came out of that with some different takes I think um, but I'm still convinced that this is really kind of meeting a need that doesn't a, a need that's already being met by other committees and other venues and avenues that maybe we need to explore a lot more we clearly need to explore a lot more to be more effective I don't think creation of an ad hoc committee to augment or supersede the response roles and responsibilities of other committees is really warranted I do, don't think that's really great policy and I am concerned about the makeup uh, and how we establish um, who's going to be on there. Um, I, you know, it was very unclear to me whether we want them to have uh, financial uh, expertise, academic expertise, a combination of all those things. Or, or, or if they don't meet that, how do we determine who sits on the committee? I, there's just too many intangibles for me to really support at this time. So um, I do appreciate the need for the discussion. That's very clear. Uh, but I think we need to explore better outcomes for the existing structures that we have both with finance committee and communications committees and the, the existing committee structure that we have without creating a secondary layer here. So I, I can't support this as it's written. Other comments? Council Hayes? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, and 
I think I kind of like to, to kind of tag on to something that Katie did, Councillor Foley did share, and that's, you know, I look at, I think this recent election we just had, there are some learnings we can grab from that or take from that. And, and I think in particular, we looked at the public safety building and, you know, we've, it, it's been a challenge trying to get the town to approve of, you know, expenditures that we know will increase our tax rates. That went through, that was accepted, it was accepted on the first vote. I think we should look at that. I, I think when <coughs> Councillor Foley said that's a good model to look to. I know I participated on that as a non-voting member of it, but there were members from the community that participated in that. They were subject matter experts all the way from construction to, to all sorts of different disciplines. <coughs> and at the time when it came to then present it to the voters, they really did a great job of getting behind it. They wrote letters to the editors. They really were non-elected officials saying this is the right thing for our community. So. I think this is a work in progress. I would like to continue the conversation about where that fits in. I know the Joint Finance Committee meetings committee is planning to meet soon. We we're hoping to meet next week, and I'm not sure we haven't checked. You know, it's not in anybody's calendar yet, but um, so I, 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 I'd be in favor of continuing to have the conversation, but I think others need to be at the table and kind of form this and have further dialogue about does this make any sense? Does it duplicate other committees or is it something different? Where can it get us? But I look at it and just think, you know, I think Councillor Foley was, was you know, we, we look at the struggle that we've had, you know, I think it's seven out of 11 budget votes have failed. We really need to think about doing something differently. I don't know what that, what that is, and I look at this and say, what's what's the upside? What's the downside? Um, so I would support just a continuing maybe exploration of a better defining what this could and should look like, if anything. So that's that's where I am. Councilor Donovan, uh, certainly improving the budget process is an admirable goal. We'd all agree on that. <clears throat> and picking up on Councilor Hayes's comments, that uh, I thought uh, the session joint session uh, with the Board of Education, uh, led by Superintendent uh, Kuchenberger, was an excellent and, and did advance our thinking in terms of ways in which we can improve the process. Uh, I've thought in recent years, we've done a remarkable job of making the process better. Uh, we've instituted a forum uh, uh, proceeding uh, we answer every single question that is presented uh, in writing and posted online. The budget f book, the formatting of the book by the town manager has been applauded as making it much uh, easier to understand uh, what's going on. We've had a whole series of improvements in the way in which we do this. Uh, meeting with the Board of Education earlier in the process, before the town manager and the superintendent present the budget at the first meeting in April, I thought was an excellent idea. So I think there's a whole series of things that can be done. I think this is burdensome and potentially divisive. And that would really concern me that it actually acts in the opposite, has the opposite effect of what we would like to see, uh, all of us would like to see happen here. So, uh, uh, I, for one, would say, no, this is not the direction I would like to see, but picking up on Councillor Hayes' suggestion, I want the discussion to continue. I think we should uh, continue to have the Finance Committee uh, as well as the Communications Committee be thinking about ways in which to improve the process. Any other questions or comments on the amendment? Ms. Foley. Um, so I did want to just uh, add a couple of things the other piece for me and why I felt like this is important is that everybody on behind this table right now is work has worked extremely hard put in countless hours um, and same for the Board of Education and while I love many of the ideas that came out of that workshop and in fact um, most of the ideas on page two th those came very verbatim from that workshop so I felt like I worked very hard to be reflective of what I heard now I will fully admit I don't think this is perfect either um, and still could use further collaboration and work. But the idea is that we bring our citizens in and we don't have to own this process alone and solely for us. It's a, we want this whole idea and concept of one town, one budget 
to have real uh, weight behind it, I guess. Uh, for me, something like this is, is one way in which we could potentially get there. Maybe it could be a disaster and then we never do it again. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, but I'm, I guess I'm uh, of the, what I hear, the feedback I hear is I hear a lot of fear. A lot of this could happen, this, this could happen. And sometimes I feel like you have to try something new to know, uh, to reap a reward and, and you know. So I, I'd actually be in favor of um, tabling it again until the new council is all at the table, uh, until further conversations could be had um, and further, you know, revision or development of the idea. But if, yeah, I, so I guess that's where I was uh, looking. People want the conversation to continue or if they feel like it needs to die right here, then, you know, we can vote and kill it right here. But uh, th that's the feedback I was actually hoping for in this conversation before we moved forward, if that makes sense to people. Council Rumley? I, I certainly don't want to kill the spirit. I just feel like we've tabled it twice with the idea that we were going to have a conversation about it. And, and for whatever reason, it, it hasn't happened. I'd rather see this be, um, this one be acted on for, for whatever we do or withdrawn. Um, and then we could have the, the, the committees that are, that are related to this talk about it and have something come out of there. Is my personal preference, so I, I wouldn't support a tabling motion at this point. Yeah. Sorry, I was getting uh, Robert's rule clarification on the withdrawal part. Um, so I'd like to actually share before the, on the next step happens, um, and it's really about the the. Um, it's not just about the amendments; it's really about the total issue. So I'm going to only speak once. Um, I am the only one that has had experience sitting on a community budget advisory ad hoc committee in this town. Um, that's at least on the council, and that was in 1999. There was a call for that on the school side, and um, that was before I got elected to the um, school board under the premise that um, we were going to dig deep into the numbers. We were going to try to do our best in making recommendations, and what we found, and I found um, as myself, is that um, there is so much information in that process that it's, it's almost too difficult to be able to accomplish what you want. It has to take longer than a simple ad hoc committee's duration. Um, two, it became more politically charged than uh, really an academic exercise in understanding the budget because people were politically driven in wanting that rather than wanting to dig deep into the numbers and, and dig deep into the programs. So I'm concerned about the intent, um, not the intent, but what it could come and be used for, um, which is not what it should be used for. And um, I'm going to, I just want to suggest one thing. Um, Council Dunham has said that this is potentially divisive. The fact is it, it already is divisive. I'm, I'm going to call it right out. The school board members that I've talked to do not want this. They think that we are not walking into this in a partnership or in a, in a positive relationship because they haven't been brought to the table and haven't had that discussion about this. I think Doc, um, I almost called her a doctor. Um, I think Superintendent Kukaberga has taken us down the right path in bringing us together and working together and that we should allow that to flourish and see what that does to the process before we jump into something in which we are in essence mandating on behalf of our colleagues on the school side. And I, I don't want to go down that. I think relationships matter and the relationship with our colleagues on the school board um, do take some precedence in when we're doing this type of action. Are there any other comments or questions on the amendment? Yes. Yeah, I would just support Councilor Rowan's uh, approach. I mean, I think we've tabled it twice already. I, I, I would prefer we deal with this in individual committees. I'm not saying that the issue isn't still there. I think we just need to address it in the right form. Um, and when it's ready to come forward in whatever format that is, that's the right time to, 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 to address it. So I, I would not support it, any kind of tabling motion or continuance. I think we need to resolve this and move forward in, in a, if it's in a similar direction or a parallel direction, so be it. But I think we need to get resolution to this issue here and here and now. Any other comments? So there's going to be two votes. First is on the amendment that Council Foley uh, proposed, and then it will be on the main motion. So um, to move the question on the amendment, all in favor of the amendment as proposed, please raise your hand. That's two. All opposed? That's four. Now on to the main motion as originally proposed without the changes that were presented to us. Is there any other comment or questions? Council Foley. Um, so I'm hearing the feedback loud and clear. Um, I would, uh, I might argue that I've had some different conversations and different feedback, but it's, it's obvious the will of the council is not to uh, head in this direction. And that's okay. Um, you know, I tried something uh, that I think would be good for the town. And uh, that's a, uh, 
you know, we're just going to have to go forward. But but I, I'm just going to go out there right now and say, you know, it's it's already the end of November, and uh, we're going to blink, and it's January, and then we're going to blink again, and we're in the budget season, and we've now done some great workshops and talking, but we haven't put anything into action to do anything different and um, or bring more people in. So that that concerns me, but I do think maybe through communications and some other venues we can pull some people together. So at this point, uh, I will withdraw the main motion or make a motion to withdraw yep. the main motion. I can do that, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. If there is no objection, we will simply withdraw the action item. Thank you. Moving on to order new business, order number 17-111 is a first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to chapter 311, the town of Scarborough's schedule of fees as presented by the ordinance committee. If I could ask, before public comment, if I could ask the chairman to give us an executive overview. <clears throat> see if we can find the... Thank you. Um, This has arisen uh, uh, as a result of wanting to get uh, fees uh, uh, on a whole series of items adjusted uh, before sales began in the spring. Uh, uh, the fees that the Ordinance Committee looked at particularly was the uh, uh, non-resident seasonal passes. Uh, we uh, selected a midpoint based on a survey that was done by the, uh, by Todd Souza, uh, our, our director, uh, and uh, he also recommended that we increase the hourly rate so that it sort of kept in balance with uh, the seasonal rate uh, from 10 to $15. Uh, daily, daily rate. Daily rate, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we have uh, also a series of others uh, that are shown on the schedule. Thank, Thank you. you. Excuse me, is there any comment from the public? Larry Hartwell, 9, Period and Drive. I've not read th through this section, um, so I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I understood that there's a, a beach fee for for between the hours of 5 and 9 a.m. I don't know if that is true or not, but if it is, uh, it seems like that is simply pointed at, at surfers. But like I say, I don't, I haven't read it, I don't know. But if it is, I think you ought to take a look at that. Any comment? No, but I will, um, through the chair, I will yes. clarify there is no beach fee um, if, um, included in this regarding what you referenced. There never has been. Never has been. So I'm not sure where you got your information, sir. Is, uh, Isn't that on, what's on this page? Nope. Is that what's not green? a beach fee. There's a daily parking fee. Parking. Oh, daily that's, parking. I, oh. I think that's Fair what he meant. Yeah. He said beach. So I would apologize <laughs> for not understanding beach to be daily parking. That's my apologies. Yeah. Um, no other comments from public? No, there's no beach fee. There's a daily parking fee. Yeah. There is a parking there's a yes. flat daily rate. There's no differentiation for hour of the day or day of the week. It's a flat hourly rate rate per day. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Ben Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, I'm looking at the daily parking fee right now. Um, in the information presented by the town, currently there is no daily parking fee from 5.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. In 2018, it will be $5.00. Um, there's a daily parking fee overall from 2017 to 2018 that is not increasing. And there was a daily parking fee from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. currently in 2017 of $5. It exists again in 2018. Um, there's daily parking fees for RVs, which is $35 in 2017. and 2018, there's just question marks. Um, so just to clarify, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Not seeing any. Um, is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? 
Council Chiazzo? Yeah, so if I could, through the chair to the uh, chair of ordinance, two quick questions. Um, could you describe par pass card for meters? What is, what is that? What is that? Which? The $1 uh, pass card. There's a line item below meters. the Higgins Beach hourly metered parking. It says pass card for meters $1. What, what is that? Uh, I believe that uh, that applies to uh, if we are going to have seniors have free parking, I think there's going to be a pass card that has to be issued. Is that right, uh, town manager? Th this year being the first year, uh, we require a license plate uh, for most folks to to use the meter, the hourly rate, or for seniors, there's actually a four-digit number that we ask them to, to put in. Uh, the meters are able to actually read a card, and there's a cost to us. So if folks wish to have that as an option, mm. we're simply charging them our cost uh, okay. for the convenience of having a card. Okay. And second question, if I could, sorry, it was to, to Mr. Howard brought that up, and I saw it as well. Yeah. Could you explain the RV um, question mark for, from, for next year versus this year? I believe that was the way it was presented by Todd Souza, but no determin it doesn't represent a, a determination of anything. So is that still to be determined, or are we dropping that no. fee for next year? No change. No change. Okay. So it is still additional $35 for daily parking fees for RVs. That, that's, okay. that's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. So, yes. If I, could, I, I believe the, the page that uh, Mr. Howard was referring to um, was informational based on what we had at the uh, ordinance committee. The, what's actually being changed is the, is the first page, which has just the non-resident seasonal, seasonal pass, the pass card, and the, uh, the daily fee. Um, and the other items that are uh, in colored green that actually reflect a change. That, so we are, we are making that change yes. tonight. We'll try and clean that schedule up so that it's uh, 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 better presented uh, for a second reading. Any other? I'm sorry, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, now I'm confused. Just, just so what Will just said, but the, the items in green are part of the dialogue tonight. It wasn't informational. Is that what you're suggesting? Will? That's correct. They are. Uh, uh, when we voted as an ordinance yeah, committee, yeah. we included all of those items, not just the uh, out of yeah. okay. the non-resident and the uh, uh, and the daily fee. So, so then I do have a question, and it gets I think the question that was asked. So, there's a daily parking fee. So, and that's ten dollars, seventeen, same for eighteen, right? Daily parking fee goes from ten uh, ten dollars to fifteen dollars. What's on what's the on the second page the schedule that has the green colors? It says ten to ten. Yeah. So what 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 is that? What daily parking fee is that? I think that was the yeah, one exception. For, for, for this, I, be, I believe that was the that was the one exception in the work pass. Pass. document that we had in session. Yeah, I think that's incorrect. Yeah, sim similarly, the season oh. parking fast pass doesn't reflect the the hundred and fifty dollars. This this was. What was presented, it w this was not updated as a result of the vote of the ordinance committee. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay, so, but, but I, my, my question really isn't that. So, so you're saying the daily parking fee, I'm on the second page, the one with the green color, daily is going from 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. But what is, so what is the 5.30 a.m. to 9 a.m.? There was no charge, and that's going to $5? Is that what we're voting on? So, yeah, so right here. So I, as I rec my recollection of the ordinance committee was that we were we discussed it, and it was really not to impact surfers. It was because very often you will show up at Higgins Beach at 9 o'clock in the morning, and the lot will be completely filled with people that, that didn't um, pay any money. And so the idea was to, to actually have <coughs> some kind of fee there to, to uh, prevent that. So, so if someone comes in at 530, are they going to pay the five dollars to park to nine, and then a daily parking fee on top of that? I believe that we didn't actually move ahead. We, the the thought is that that there there's discussion around having an automated um, attendant there, um, and so there would be different a different schedule. Well, so, uh, okay, I'm just a little. So maybe by second read we can clear up. I think that's what, that's what the intent was, because um, I'm confused about what. 
So, um, if you, I'll come, oh, you next. Yep. So the question I have is, um, um, I'm a little bit uh, imp on an impasse on this, and that is because um, this should be cleaner than what it is, and would like to ask if one, if you are all comfortable in voting on the first reading, scheduling a public hearing, or whether this should, this should be tabled and sent back and given us in a cleaner format so that we can be clear, so that the public can be clear as well. What is the will? I, I suggest we, it's first reading. We move it through, make any adjustments or, or changes we necessary for second reading. I mean, this is, I, I would support moving okay. it forward. Is everyone comfortable with that? I just, yeah, comfortable yeah I, I'm okay with that. I mean, okay. I, I don't like or support the 5 to 9 a.m. charge at all myself, but that's the only, all the other increases that are there, I, I support. So if it comes back to us, I mean, for purposes of putting it through tonight till it comes back to us at second reading, um, I'm fine with that. Okay. Any other comments or questions for first reading? And the public hearing will be on December 6, 2017. Um, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. So, if, Tom, if you can work on that I with can. the ordinance committee. Yeah, I beg your pardon. I'm yep. confused. Uh, moving on to order number 17-112, first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough's Traffic Ordinance, Section 25A, Parking Restrictions. Is there anybody from the public that would like to get up and speak? Yeah, I like it. They're lining up. Look at that. <laughs> I like oh, it. Here to talk. That's right. Um, this, this is regards to. If you can state your name and uh, address for the yes. clerk. For uh, Jeff Gambardella. This is Nonsuch River Brewing. So it's 201 Gorm Road. Oh, sorry. One of the owners of the brewery um, and restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the restaurant guy. <laughs> um, this is about banning parking for a, a period of time in front of our business and just in front of our business. And as we completely understand the safety aspect of this and looking at the sight line and the cars there um, and the safety of our, our guests as well as our neighbors and employees pulling in and out, um, I really don't feel that banning the parking is really the answer to the safety. I mean, yes, there's a sight line issue, but there's a sight line issue with cars or without cars. There's a sight line issue with snow banks and we can't ban snowbanks. Um, and so I really feel that if we can get transportation to help us lower the speed limit, and lowering the speed limit, I think, is gonna help tremendously in that area, um, as well as getting future businesses to wanna come to this new zoning that we have. We've got this new zoning of businesses there. We're the first to take advantage of it. I think it would be awesome for that area to grow into more businesses and be encouraging for more businesses to come with lighting the, the roadway or lowering, and lowering the speed limit and making it safe all around. Um, the reason why we don't want it, the parking to be banned is it does affect our business. It affects our dollar amount. Um, looking at the numbers, a car can be worth in the evening $100 per car. And we can get 20 cars throughout the night to park on the street. It's $2,000. $2,000 can just, that's our entire payroll for a day on a Friday or a Saturday for all of our employees. Um, we just, we don't want to see it go away permanently. We don't want to see it go away even if for a period of time because of snow. And we're not going to park there when there's snow. There's a city ordinance that there's a parking ban for plowing. That's great. And when there's snow banks, we can't park there. And then we'll have to deal with that anyway. But there's a lot of time throughout the winter where there is no snow. There's a lot of time where there's, there's, there's mild winters, there's um, periods where it all melts and goes away for a while. If we can have the advantage of having that parking for our, for our guests, it would be great. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you guys. Do I get to reset this button? There you go. <laughs> Tim Boardman, um, also 201 Gorham Road, Nunsuch River Brewery. I just want to touch on a few things that Jeff said, uh, particularly in regards to the zoning. Um, the town recently rezoned this to try to create more of a town center atmosphere. And I think what goes along with that town center atmosphere is slower traffic, wider roads, better lit streets um, to encourage this type of business growth that the town has designated for this area. Um, so I don't really believe we should be penalized for taking advantage of something that the town clearly wants to happen, and that's growing new businesses. Um, 
in this area. And again, also, I want to thank the town for uh, being a strong advocate of small business support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Schuler, 201 Gorham Road, on Such River Brewing. Um, I think having an ordinance written specifically for this address is I, I think there's other ways that we can that we can accomplish that um, if we if we put a sign in the road that says no parking November to April what if it doesn't snow till January I, I, I think we we have a we have a, a town parking ban that is um, publicized when plows are out I think when that ban is there and plow trucks are going that uh, people don't park there when there's a large snowbank I think common sense says that you don't park there and if somebody does happen to park there and it's dangerous I think we have police that can look at that so I just I just don't I don't think that that we need to put an ordinance in place for this specific address I think we should be looking more globally we look forward to being a strong partner with the road building efforts that will be coming in the next couple of years certainly understand that that's coming it's just we're there now and that's coming not now so we'd like to figure out a way where we can all work together to make this work and then make that roadway um, great when it's happening thank you. thank you for your time thank you I did want to um, just point out one clarification for you regarding the um, uh, reduction in speed um, so that road is a state road and we would actually have to petition the state in order to um, make any attempt in reducing that speed so it would be a rather lengthy process that's outside of our control but it's something we could look at and, and the, the data uh, that was obtained on what the speed is going out there is uh, about uh, at the 80th, 85th percentile which is the measurement used to determine uh, where you set the speed was 41 miles an hour uh, and so in talking with the town planner Jay Chase he said there's very little chance that we could get the state to ever change that speed limit I Excuse, I'd like to disagree with that because recently the um, the turnpike uh, the 295 north of Portland was raised to 70 miles an hour and they realized that the accident rate went up at least 40 percent so then they quickly lowered that speed limit because they realized there was an unsafe condition so I don't necessarily agree with that opinion because because people drive fast doesn't mean they're going to increase the speed limit it means that they need to look at that and they do have mechanisms in place to reduce that to make it more safe thank you thank you for the information um, is there anybody else that would like to speak? Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. I just want to say that um, I grew up on that stretch of road that they're talking about, and I know a good deal of uh, amount of residents along that stretch from uh, approximately um, Sawyer Road down past eight corners two Shaw's even um, a relative lives in the house there that was burned not too long ago and I, I I almost can say that most of the residents along that stretch would welcome a reduction in speed limit I mean because it's 35 now no one's going 35 they would welcome a reduction in the speed limit I think if it was possible to do it at a state level so thank you anybody else that would like to speak not seeing any we'll close the public comment is there a motion from council moved second comments and questions from council council Donovan uh, this is a proposal came to us from the uh, police department the ordinance committee uh, received it uh, the police department the chief uh, uh, sergeant O'Malley both appeared uh, they made a very strong case for the uh, the risk that was involved here uh, we were as an ordinance committee sympathetic to the business because they'd met all the requirements of parking on site uh, and so it had the sense of pulling the rug out from underneath them uh, we ended up uh, uh, 
voting in two to one in favor of uh, a temporary uh, ban on parking in that limited area uh, until April 1. Uh, the idea being, let's find a better solution than what we're presenting. But in the meantime, uh, public safety is telling us it's important to not allow parking along that stretch during the winter when the winter conditions will really exacerbate things. Can we find a better outcome? I hope so. And, uh, and I think we will, staff as well as myself, will work on that. Other comments? Council Chiazzo. Yeah, if I could, I'd like to entertain a motion um, to amend. And uh, if you bear with me and I get a second, I'll be happy to explain why. I'd like to amend uh, Section 18 to read no parking. And I'm, I'm going to look to staff for guidance on this. I assume it's the north side of, route of, of Gore Road, which is the brewery side. I just arbitrarily picked a direction. But the intent is the, the side that the brewery and most of the houses are on. Uh, so I'm going to input north here just for clarification purposes. But uh, if that's incorrect, we can amend and adjust to that side of Gorham Road from 183 Gorham Road to the intersection of Gorham Road and Spring Street at number 209. And I want to remove the temporary restriction which expires April 1st, 2018. And I'd be happy to explain if I can get a second. Is there a second? For I'll second. Thank you. Okay. So um, there's a couple things going on here. Um, I, I, I've been down to the road a couple times. Um, I, I think um, there's clearly a safety issue. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I attended the ordinance committee meeting. There's clearly a safety issue with that lane of uh, that line of sight on that lane, even without snow banks. Um, that's one issue that's that's here. There's new signage that's gone up in, in front of the business now. I think that will be a little bit clearer in terms of alleviating some of the uh, citizen concerns that were addressed at the ordinance committee with a few a few neighbors got up and complained about people turning around in their driveways and parking in front of their houses I think by eliminating parking completely on that side of the street we can address the safety concerns with the line of sight and we can also alleviate some of the concerns of the residences with people parking in front of their houses or turning around in their driveways most of the houses on the others there, there are very few if any houses on the other side of the of the uh, of Gorham Road um, and that shoulder is actually wide enough to accommodate vehicles, I think, a little more safely. So the reason I suggested we make that permanent is, is number one, to alleviate the concerns of the residents on that side, but not penalize them. Uh, the, the, the temporary parking, I, I'm going to commend Councillor Rowan. I think that was a good compromise to try and come up with what was there. What wasn't really presented at ordinance was the fact that transportation has been looking at the Gorham Road uh, uh, adjustments. We're looking at slip, lip, slip lanes, turn lanes. Um, we're looking at different uh, potential either traffic calming or different aspects of how we're going to approach Gorham Road. And I think we could do something very similar on Gorham Road that we did on Pine Point Road by giving that shoulder a little bit of space and maybe designing a safe, well-lit, efficient crosswalk in line with our complete streets policy. So it, my purpose of the amendment is twofold. One, you need to address the safety concerns that I think are legitimate now that were presented by public safety. But it's not overly burdened on the existing business because we still give them the option of parking across the street. And bear in mind, they're not directing people to park there. That is the choice of people who are going in there. There's nobody standing at the front door saying, please park over here, or signs directing people to park across the street. Uh, I think the safety issue with the plowing and, and snow removal issues are, are valid however they're no different than any other street in scarborough and if we have a public safety ban or a parking ban because of plowing that's going to be impactful there as well so i'm trying to strike that balance between not impacting the business and doing undue harm to the business but acknowledging the safety factor that's going on there and addressing some of the the uh, uh resident concerns council donovan uh, i've had a lot of the same thoughts that councillor kezu has had uh you've put them in the form of an amendment and uh, it, it's struck me that if the Department of Public Works and the Planning Department and the town engineer uh, uh, were able to appear before us and say that they can address the snow issue, the crossing issue, uh, uh, then I think I'd be in favor of what you're proposing. Uh, 
That really, I think, is the question. Can we safely have people cross the street there? Uh, that we've had a death just up the street from there. Uh, and it's dark and it's fast. Uh, and so uh, if we were to get that kind of buy-in from those who are charged with the public safety of this community, then I think I could support this. Councilor Foley? Um, you know, I think one of the things that occurs to me and the reason we're here is, is a good problem. It's a problem of abundance, right? You're being very successful and we should be celebrating that. So uh, happy to have a, a new business in town that's the successful that we're having this problem. I do think the um, safety concerns brought to us are completely legit. It is very dark uh, on that road. Um, but I like where Councilor Chiazzo is going with this. I think it strikes a little bit of a, a balance. Um, and, I, and I think it's harder to pull back once you have a complete ban. So this would be at least, I'd like to see some other creative options uh, explored further. Um, but I think for the interim, I think this is a little bit better solution than, than the originally proposed piece. So I would, I would support this amendment. Councilor Rowan? Yeah, so um, I think one of the, so it was somewhat discussed at, at ordinance with the, with the police department here. Um, their concerns with that were, were really around, there's no lighting there, there are no street lights. Mm -hmm. I don't know how quickly we could get one there. Um, and there's no crosswalk. And so there was really some concern with the parking on the other side of the street, but it was observed that there's more room there. And so I think that, that exploring both of those issues would be, would be valid um, or would be, uh, I think, <laughs> would be a good thing to do. Um, I think the other thing, I'd, I'd love to explore the lowering the speed limit there. I think that's a, that is a, um, I don't know what it takes to petition the state to, to lower the speed limit, but I do think that it, it certainly warranted and should be explored. Um, I, I think that um, the, um, I guess that it, it would be a question of timing in terms of whether I could support the amendment, because I, I do think that we have those concerns. So we wouldn't really be seeing this um, parking ban be enacted until end of December. Um, public, uh, the, the public hearing is December 6th, and then second, second reading would be December 20th. Um, no public ban at that point. Uh, it could be a mild winter, that's, that's certain, but you know, in all likelihood we'll have um, snow banks which are gonna preclude parking there anyway. Um, and um, uh, I think that while we're exploring those um, viewpoints, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it come back with, with some ideas, which I think was the idea of why we put the, the the end date on this thing. So this wasn't a perpetual ban. This was a, a really three month, three and a half month um, ban in place. And so I, I'd like to see that stay. Uh, but I could, I could, if we could resolve the safety issue of crossing that street, I could definitely support only doing it on one side of the street. Uh, but I would like to see the, the end date um, so that we have to act again. Councilor Chiazzo? Yeah, so um, in, in light of, of Councilor comments, I would be happy to amend the, emo the motion to include the temporary, reinstitute the temporary restriction which expires April 1st. My only intent with making it permanent was to address the, the resident needs and give them a little bit of satisfaction or at least understanding that that, that will be part of the final solution at some point. Um, to address some of the other issues of exploring other options, we certainly are taking this up in transportation where we do have access to traffic studies, the traffic, uh, the town engineer is available, we have public safety access, um, and we are looking at this more of a, from, a, from a systemic type of approach, which I think is the right thing to do for the town and, as opposed to doing it site specific. Um, I'll also point out to the council that um, there's parking on Gorham Road right now every Sunday, and it's very restrictive. Uh, it, it, I shouldn't say, it's not restrictive from an ordinance perspective, but there's lots of cars in front of that rock church yeah. every Sunday on both sides of the street. So I'm a little uncomfortable making an exception for one group and not enforcing with another. So I, I really think we could strike a balance of, of not inhibiting the business too, too much, but taking that safety, and safety situation into account. And I would be happy to, to uh, you know, hear input from public safety because the impression I got from that meeting is, you know, uh, public safety is not interested in restricting business either. They want to come up with a good compromise and a good solution. So um, I'd, I'd be happy to, to table it or move it forward waiting for input from public safety. Councilor Foley, I hit you next. I, well, I was just trying to clarify. So Councilor Chiazzo had said the north side, which I believe is the side the restaurant's on, correct? Mm -hmm. So the so they wouldn't be crossing. 
and that's spot. Banning it on the north banning side. Banning it on that side. Oh, okay. I had it reversed in my head. I was thinking they'd park on that side and not, so then the issue of crossing wouldn't be as much of an issue. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Councilor Hayes, I had your hand up once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess where I am, whether it's on the motion or, or the main motion, is I'm really uncomfortable putting a ban on at this point in time without doing some of that additional work we just discussed. I mean, when you start talking about two thousand dollars a night for a startup business, that's 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 significant. And you know, if you're talking 150 days or so that that ban's going to be in place, I would I would rather see us do some some as much coordination as we can with all the other different aspects of town to see if we can get to a different solution. I, I hate to put a temporary ban in place. Um, it very it will impact their business, and there are new business in town. They're thriving. I'd love to find us a way that we can do that without impacting their business. So I, I can't support a, a parking restriction at this time. Uh, Councilor Rowan, I hit you next. Yep. So um, I'd, I'd have two two uh, responses. One is that we also need to. Um, we had neighbors come to the ordinance committee whose whose um, needs for being able to make a safe turn out of their driveway need to be also considered when we're when we're thinking about the financial impact on this business. Um, the the um, there's a real issue with safety. We did have a death down the road. Um, not, I don't remember the details. I don't remember when it was, but but there was a woman that was leaving a restaurant um, less than a mile from there that that was struck and killed. Um, and I had a second point in response to Chiazzo, um, <laughs> and I'm going to have to come back to okay. it. <laughs> Council Chiazzo. He'll so, refresh your memory. He's yeah, next. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure as soon as I said, like, oh, wait a minute. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, just to, to address Councillor Hayes' point, I, I do think that there is a legitimate concern with line of sight there. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, it, it really is just that one, I shouldn't say it's just that one lane. It's more predominant that one lane. Um, coming out of there and making a, a left hand or right hand turn out of even a driveway there um, is, is challenging. And I, I certainly, I think public safety acknowledged that fact. I just don't want us to overreact. Um, we have to acknowledge the safety. That's first and foremost and paramount. I have spoken to the owners um, about if this is a, a compromise that's reasonable. Um, I, 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 I think it is because it still gives them the option, um, you know, as long as weather permits, uh, it gives their, their clients an option to park there. As I said, they're not endorsing this or directing people there. It's kind of a, hopefully a common sense issue where if it's an unsafe situation, people are going to take that into consideration and it's not worth killing yourself over a, a meal or a, or, a, or a pint, although some may think differently. But um, so I, I think this, you know, again, I also think this buys us a little time to work it through transportation because we are going to redesign that road to some extent in the next, next cycle. It, that's, I think, phase number two or three on Gorham. Three, um, so we will be able to address this, I think, with a, yeah. a much more aesthetically pleasing layout and a compromise. Like I said, probably very similar to what we've done on Pine Point Road, where we could actually designate maybe some parking on that side. But we certainly could work with local businesses and transportation groups to, to really kind of define and design that intersection, if you will, to be more open to safe crossings and complete streets, like we've always talked about as part of our policy. So, Council Rowan. So, uh, Karen. Uh, Completely lost my response from before, but a different uh, <laughs> subject. Uh, curious, how long how long would it take to get a crosswalk there and a street light there? Because it, that's one of the, I think that's a real concern that we need to, to consider before we. Close. Here we go. Go ahead. I, well, from a public, I mean, from a transportation standpoint, I mean, I would hate, and, and a fiscal responsibility standpoint, I'd hate to put up a street light and then six months or a year or, or even two years later rip it down again because we're going to widen the street or something. I think there's lighting now in front of their sign. I think in front of the business itself, it's, it's fairly well lit. My, the only concern I would have is closer to the intersection at eight corners or farther down the road the other way. Um, and and I, don't, I don't know if really we have, certainly don't have a budget this year for that. Um, I don't know what dollar value we'd want to put on that for next year, but I'd have a hard time putting something in as a temporary stop gap and then ripping it out again in, in two or three years later. To the manager. Uh, with respect to crosswalks, we, certainly staff would like to provide comment. I, frankly, in my experience, I can't imagine a scenario with the current road section and other amenities in that area where crosswalk, uh, we would be recommending a crosswalk. In almost all cases, there needs to be safe refuge for a pedestrian from one side of the road to the other, essentially sidewalk on either side. And of course, we don't have that. So it sounds easy, but it's not, um, it's not advisable necessarily 
uh, you're potentially putting pedestrians at risk, putting them in harm's way uh, without those proper protections around it. So I, I'm certainly pleased to have staff more knowledgeable about these issues than me weigh in, but I think that's going to be a, a, quite a challenge. Councillor Foley. <clears throat> um, yes, and I, I don't, so I don't want to be a downer to the restaurant folks, but I do know, you know, it's winter is coming and there's a tendency for that business to slow down. I waitressed and bartended all through college. And so, uh, you know, because you haven't been through a full cycle yet, we don't necessarily even know. So the initial success when something first, first opens is like everybody wants to go there. Um, so what has been a big problem thus far may not be as big a problem going forward. So that's the other reason why I really like the amendment because I think it, pre it prevents it or provides a, a bit of a compromise as some of those other things are being explored. So right now I, my way of thinking anyway is just I'm, I'm more supportive of, of the amendment than I am the original proposal. Um, Kiazza, Council well, Kiazza, yeah, and just just to be clear, I, like I said, I would I would I would put back in the temporary restriction until April one if it if it made the council happy and we could again have something in transportation to have something a little bit clearer and more concise. If there's no objection, sure. if there's no objection, I would just add it back in as a friendly amendment to the amendment. So we'll add as if it never was taken up. Any other comments, Council Donovan? Uh, I think we probably all would ask to have uh, a DPW planning and town engineer report to us. We're going to have a public hearing in a couple of weeks. I think we'd all like to hear from them as to what's uh, advisable in light of what seems to be a roundly supported amendment. So before we go too far with it, I think we'd all like to understand what are the implications. So. I would ask that that be done and presented for pub at the public hearing. Certainly. Any other comments? Um, so I would like to just add, um, so I actually walked in here really with a, a presumption that um, based on the ones that I've talked to is to ban parking completely on both sides because I've come around that corner late at night and there's someone right in the middle of the road crossing the street and it just catches you because they're not wearing anything. and. Um, the question I have, two things. One is I really do hope that the town pursues, uh, pursues a request with the state for speed reduction. It does appear fairly clearly that um, there is a need for that and desire for it um, given that intersection. But two, the question I have is for, for the manager maybe, what can we do to change the approval process that vets this type of issue out in advance? Because, you know, I have some friends that are like, you didn't think this beforehand? You didn't expect people to park on the side of the road? Why didn't you take that into consideration when you approved the, the site permit or when you approved the plans in the first place? So I'd like to maybe understand how we might be able to vet this type of issue in advance so that there's proper planning up front rather than backloading it when the, it eventually happens. So This matter was discussed in great detail at the planning board and I believe the applicant demonstrated that they could provide for their needs on site. And so I don't believe there's any official reliance on okay. uh, on street parking um, apparently it's happening but it was certainly not an issue that was overlooked it was uh, discussed in great detail I see nodding heads <laughs> I know there was a lot of talk about a different parking lot but uh, we only not go down that path did you say once I, well, I just wanted to comment that you know uh, Jay Chase did get up in, at the ordinance committee and say you know they they met the minimum requirements. Uh, it was an issue of, for planning to look at, and they looked at it, but at the end determined that they had met the minimum requirements, so they did pass it unanimously. Now, does that mean that was the wrong choice? I mean, we have other examples in town of other restaurants and mm. places that parking is an issue. You know, I think that's a separate issue from where we're at right here, and maybe that's better direction from us to planning mm. or something else we could do to, to make that a little bit more restrictive. But I'd hate to see us penalizing one business over Oh, another. I totally agree. You know, but for something like that. Just, just a final comment. When it comes to parking, businesses will never short themselves. It's, it's right. only shooting themselves in the foot. So yeah. very often the business knows better than we do. Uh, so we do have minimum standards, and there were some real challenges and site constraints uh, on this site. I think in different circumstances, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this. Uh, Councilor Rowan, oh, I, 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 I got my I recalled. Thank you. Uh, it was in reference to the parking on Sunday at, at the uh, the Rock Church. I think it's a very different uh, because the, the road is very wide there. There's a very wide shoulder here. There's it's it's very straight, uh, very flat. And there's no shoulder at all. It, there's a, mm. a dip, a curve. So I, I, and it's it's really, and it's well lit and most most Sundays. If there are no other comments. Um, <laughs>
The motion on the floor is to amend the motion as Councilor Chiazzo um, has requested, um, inserting back in the expiration or the temporary expiration. Is there any other comments? Moving the question, all in favor? And that is unanimous. And on to the main motion as amended. If there's no more comments, all in favor of the main motion as amended? One, two, three, four. Opposed? Two. And those were? Uh, Councilor Hayes Maybe and Councilor Foley. Confused. Did we just vote for his amendment or did we vote? For so, sir, as amendment. And keep in mind that that was a first reading. It will go to a public hearing on December 6th. Moving on to okay. order number 17 113. It's a first reading and schedule a second reading. First reading and schedule a second reading on the bond order for the 2018 municipal and school capital improvements and the refunding of certain general obligation bonds of the town as presented by the town manager. Is there anybody that would like to speak on the item? Larry Hartwell, Nine Period and Drive. Just a question as I was reading through it, I understand uh, refinancing to, for lower interest rates and saving tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of a 20 or 30 year bond. Uh, what I didn't understand, or at least I interpreted, that we're going to have some sort of immediate um, savings or m funds coming to us in the order of over $300,000, and I just didn't understand that, that portion of it. Is there any other comments? Not seeing any. I'll turn it over to the manager for a presentation yes. on the topic. Thank you. Um, first, uh, it may occur to members of the public and council that this matters, uh, you know, bond questions are before you several months earlier than normal. Our typical routine is to bond in the spring of every year in the uh, April, May time frame. Uh, this year we were presented with an opportunity uh, presented by our financial advisor uh, actually on uh, October 27th, and that was an opportunity to do what's called an advance refunding. There are a certain series of bonds. In this case, it's uh, bonds from 2010, 12, and 13 that, uh, given some very attractive rates that we think we can obtain in the near term, uh, will and, and will produce some significant savings, significant enough to um, advance at least that part of this conversation, and I would highly recommend we do that anyway. Um, I was presented with an opportunity um, the following Monday. Actually, the Finance Committee had the regular meeting, and I used the opportunity at the uh, discretion of the Chair to at least broach this issue uh, with, the, with the Finance Committee, and we considered uh, a number of different options regarding the refunding, and there are some options, choices to be made. Uh, also regarding timing, and at the time I alluded to the fact that uh, while we're going to issue bonds, we may also consider issuing some new money as well. And so following that Finance Committee meeting, uh, staff undertook a process to look at our, our capital improvement project needs and really kind of accelerate that borrowing um, sooner than we would otherwise. Uh, and I guess the final piece is the voters did approve the public safety building on November 7th, and so there's um, uh, yet another new money need, and we are moving briskly to move forward the design and construction process and all of this is really um, focused on um, accessing the market while the inter interest rates are very attractive. So that's true of both the advanced refunding and uh, in the new borrowing. We obviously want to borrow at the best rates possible. So what's before you this evening has two components, uh, two primary pieces. Uh, one is the advanced refunding. Uh, those series total about uh, $13,135,000. Uh, based on um, our analyst projections, we're looking at uh, present value savings uh, by re advanced refunding these of over $600,000, about $606,000, or a uh, present value savings percentage of about 4.56. Just to put that in perspective, anything over two, the advisors are <coughs> in, so this is certainly a substantial enough um, savings uh, over the term of these low, uh, these these bonds to make this attractive and and we should consider it uh, the other component has kind of two pieces which is the the new borrowing uh, we've identified capital improvements projects that are listed by year of approval through the budget process um, totaling three million nine hundred twenty five thousand dollars there's probably 20 different items they're all listed here and then the final piece is uh, we've analyzed what our likely cash flow needs for the public safety building will be, at least in the near term, and also considered that against arbitrage limits in terms of how quickly we need to spend um, 
taxes and bonds. Uh, these are IRS and uh, SEC regulations. Um, essentially, we've got 24 months to spend the money, and given our um, timeline that we're on for public safety, we're confident we can do that. Uh, so there's a new money component of this request uh, totaling $19,925,000. Um, so all toll, we're looking at bonding just over $35 million. Uh, this analysis considers a bond premium of about $3.4 million, and these are some pieces that our financial advisor um, can provide some more commentary on. Um, and so we're before you with this a bit of an accelerated schedule really to ensure that we can hit the market in January. And there is a concern that rates are going to climb upward, and it's important that we strike uh, as soon as we can. Given your adoption process, this requires a first and second reading, of course, uh, and a number of other uh, housekeeping matters that bond counsel and legal advisors need to assist us on. So uh, I apologize for this coming to you kind of without much notice, but I, I really see this as an opportunity that we uh, not only should consider, but we should take. I guess the final piece is uh, there are some choices to be made. What's before you really represents staff's recommendations for those different elements. Uh, our financial advisor will be available at uh, your next meeting if that's of, of value and use, and I certainly can make sure he's here to answer your questions. And it may be advisable that the Finance Committee or a subset of this group uh, want to meet with them separately to really understand the different mechanics. Um, but I guess I, if that's the case, I do ask for your indulgence that we try to keep on schedule just to make sure we can hit the market in January. So I know there's a lot there, but um, I'm certainly pleased to take questions. Um, so to begin that process, if we could have a motion. Well, so moved. Second. Uh, questions, Council Rowan. Could could you explain the advance refunding just a, a little bit more? Does that extend the term of the of the bonds? Is that it does not. Uh, it's um, just, it just shifts around the time period in which you're. It's simply it. lower interest rate, um, okay. and given the magnitude, um, a couple of basis points. In this case, it's uh, it's more than just a couple of basis points. Produces significant interest cost savings over the time. The choices that we can make have to do with how we enjoy those savings, whether we enjoy them all up front, and that's essentially what staff's recommending, to enjoy them in the first two years, FY19 and 20, or spread them evenly out over the course of the, the term. Uh, those are the sorts of decision points that need to be made. Uh, Council Chiazzo. So uh, I have a couple questions, um, so bear with me if you would, please. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is um, I'm looking at the the um, total bonding, total CIPs versus total to bond on both years, 2016, 17, and 2017, 18. And um, if I'm understanding this correctly, let's use 2016, 17 as an example. We have the total amount to be bonded was 3,068,707 of which we're bonding 915,782 right now. So my question is, the other 2.1 million, is that not to be bonded later? Is that already been bonded? Or is that something that we're choosing to finance differently? You follow what I'm saying? Need to, I'm not sure if I follow the question. OK, so if you, look at, if you look at the lines underneath each one of these sections, 2016-17 municipal projects, you have the two line items, and then you have total 2016-17 CIP is 2,113,632, total 1,885,932 to bond. Okay, so I'm assuming that was the percentage that we assumed that staff was going to bond versus uh, other forms of, of financing. So when you add up that bond on the municipal projects and municipal school, the 1.8 million plus the 1.182 million, we get a total of anticipated bonding of 3,068,702. Doesn't mean we have to bond that, but my understanding is that's what we've looked at as the amount to be bonded. Is that correct? Of that total? Or maybe someone can explain to me what, what those numbers mean. To, what, where, are you, where are you getting your numbers? Yeah. On, on page two, ah. sorry, um, one and two, we've got a list of all in the bond order itself. Okay. Okay. If you look at under each section, there's a finalize. There's a total on the bottom. It says total amount CIP and then total to bond. So maybe we'll start with the beginning. What is that? What do those numbers mean? 
Well, we do an analysis to know when we need the money. Mm -hmm. All the projects aren't ready at the same time, though mm -hmm. they may be approved in a given budget year, there's often you know, a delay in the need. And as I mentioned earlier, given the arbitrage requirements, we need to be very careful that we don't borrow money until we, ha we know we're, we're going to need it. And so I think that analysis is showing, though, that, that there is budget authority, but we're only proposing to bond a certain portion of that. That's, that's where I was getting to, is, is so if we're authorized, as I said, so let's use the last two for an example, 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we authorize the release of using those numbers that are in front of us, mm -hmm. 3,068,707 in bonds. What you've proposed for that section is 915,782 to be bonded. So my question is, do we have an additional 2.1 million in bonding coming forward, or are we choosing to finance that differently, or has that already been bonded? Please, Ruth. Hi, Ruth Porter, Finance Director. The, um, on the 16, 17 projects, uh, the little blurbs in the middle that says total 2 million 113, mm -hmm. Available to bond is a million eight eight five. What that means is, in fiscal sixteen seventeen, that two million one thirteen six thirty two, for example, was the total amount of the, all of the CIP projects. Of that two million one thirteen, one million eight eighty five nine thirty two was scheduled to be bonded. So um, a portion of that one million eight eighty five nine thirty two may have already been bonded. Uh, we're just taking this one portion of it for this uh, particular bond issue that we're coming to you with. So um, I do have, I'm not sure I have it with me today, but I do have how much of that is still available or needs to be bonded or has been bonded. Okay. Uh, just for clarification, if you recall, Councilor Chiazzo, um, we do receive a report, I believe, at the end of each fiscal year that compares all of our projects that have been approved. Yeah. Uh, both under the CIP as well as equipment, and it shows what has been bonded and what is remaining, and if the project has been completed or not moving forward, then generally staff will come forward and ask to to release that and, and to remove it so that remove it's the not... Authority. Yeah. And I'm perfectly aware that my, my point was just for public clarification yeah. because the numbers were... Right. They, they make sense and they line up, but they could be confusing looking at oh, how yeah. much is bonding, how much is left, are we not bonding anymore, what are the... I was just looking for clarity on what those actually meant, so... I, I appreciate that explanation. Um, two, two other questions. Um, we have Eastern Trail improvements for 110,000 on there. Does that mean that they've closed the gap? Because I understand we were funding that based on their ability to raise capital, and we're bonding it now, correct? It was always designated to be bonded. Uh, the Close the Gap campaign continues. Right. Um, which year is that show in? 2016 17 municipal projects. It's our local match. And I know we authorized it, and I'm, I'm comfortable with that, but I, I recall we, we made it conditional on them yeah. completing the campaign. So my question is, are we really, if we're really bonding it now and we're taking out those funds, have they completed the project, or are we doing this in advance to... I, I believe they, uh, they've completed their local fundraising. It's fallen short. The gap okay. still exists, okay. and uh, there is an effort to have DOT fill in, the, fill in that gap. Okay. So we are authorizing, we are releasing this bond now for, for their benefit. That's my understanding. That's what staff is, has advised. We can, I can check specifically on that one, but uh, that's what, uh, anything in that column, we now have confidence that we will need these funds in the near term. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> final question, I, I guess more comment, is uh, I do recall the, the um, um, refunding scenarios that we discussed at finance. Mm -hmm. uh, I would appreciate access to bond council to run those scenarios through because I do sure. recall we had a discussion on which scenario. Each one has its pros and cons right. uh, and, its, and its strengths and weaknesses, and I, I would appreciate input from them to help guide us through which decision to make with that. So I would certainly make myself available between now and then uh, sooner as, as necessary uh, so Great. that we can make sure we stay on task, but I would like some clarification there. Right, and I do have copies of the materials that Finance Committee was provided that evening, so I, I beg your pardon for those that weren't part of that conversation. I'm sure it's hard to follow along. I'm not sure if it's of value to s circulate those now. I'm certainly pleased to, uh, but certainly uh, Finance Advisor um, will, will make themselves available t to guide that conversation. Okay, thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, you know, and then just to kind of, Tag, tag on to what 
Council, as I said, Tom, I, I think maybe it would make sense just to kind of pass that out and for the, for the sure. council members and also for the audience. Um, the council, the finance committee did look at some of the different scenarios and, and really the scenarios boil down to as we get the, the, the premiums back, we either can take a lion's chunk of that in the first couple of years versus a pretty even amount over a longer period of time. So it's a really question to all of us about how we want to manage that. So I think mm -hmm. as we progress to the second reading, take a look at the numbers. Um, I think it's scenarios one and three we're looking at. Um, we can walk you through that, but it would be important to take a look at. There is some, some implications to budget impacts and other things. So we didn't conclude, but I think we, we were more on the court of taking it evenly over time rather than accelerating it to you, but that's, but we didn't make a recommendation, we didn't get there, but it, it's an important mm -hmm. discussion we will need. And Tom, what would be the timing? You said there is some time to make that decision on which scenario we undertake, or what's the timing? I, I think there's actually time on that one even after second reading, but if okay. we can do this before or as part of second reading, all the better. Okay. Just to direct your attention, if you just simply turn to page two, you'll see a, three scenarios. Uh, frankly, I'm not sure why they even proposed scenario number two. You'll see the flag or the note there in the pink. Uh, essentially, we can't do it because you can't have negative savings. So uh, for purposes of this conversation, there's really two scenarios, one and three, that are viable. And the first one simply levels out, as we looked at the amortization schedule, the savings out over the term. And scenario three front loads it. And if you look above, the present value savings of those options are fairly close together. One's uh, 560,000, 561. The other one is uh, 542. Uh, whereas if you look at the cash flow savings, the bold number down below that, you'll see the spread gets a little wider. And that's really a function of the value of money over time. Uh, present value savings, uh, that's why those numbers are much closer. A um, dollar 25 years from now is not worth what it is today. So there are choices, there are options, and frankly, staff has recommended this in recognition that we're gonna have some challenges over the next two budget cycles, and um, some relief on debt service uh, may be real key to those uh, conversations. Council Dunham. Uh, pr process question, uh, this order, uh, it says first reading, schedule the second reading. Is there a public hearing obligation here? No. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor of the motion? That is unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to order number 17-114, act to receive a request for discontinuance of a portion of Beach Ridge Road and schedule a public hearing as presented by the town engineer. Before public comment, I'll ask the engineer for any presentation. Good evening, Angela Blanchett, the town engineer. Uh, I'm here tonight because I received a request um, from the residents at 43 Beach Ridge Road. Uh, Pamela Dillon is here in the audience as well um, to give her um, information on her request. But essentially, you've heard this. I was in front of you back in May um, for 41 Beach Ridge Road. This stretch of road um, has over time been widened because of the turnpike overpass. It is now stands at 150 feet wide. Um, the residents next door had their house burnt down. They had to rebuild. Um, there was some issues with setback. And talking with the public works director um, and the residents, the, the need for 150 foot wide right away is, is not necessary for our purposes. So it was really coming in front of the council um, to see how you, how you felt about giving up a portion of that right of way. Uh, they're asking at this point for just over 5,000 square feet of that right of way, um, the Dillons, and what that leaves us with is a 150 foot right of way. Our typical right of way in town is 50 feet wide, so we're more than double that. Um, it does not impact anything with our drainage or snow storage or any of those um, issues. I know the Dillons were talking about um, just some minor um, improvements to porches and things like that, um, which this would impact the, those setbacks. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Anybody that would like to speak from the public before the council goes on? 
Not seeing any. Um, is there a motion from council? So move. move. Uh, Second. Thank you. Any questions for the engineer? Council Chiazzo? If I could, this may be more for, for, for Tom or staff. Um, does this trigger a revaluation of the property value? Uh, or is it, or it, does it just kind of sit there until another aspect changes it? No, it would certainly have implications to the extent that uh, the land area is increasing. Uh, the same land schedules will be applied, but okay. to a greater area. So I expect it will have an implication. Okay. Right, and with the last round, um, with the Williams property next door, you had, I think, brought up something like that. I did talk with the Williams and actually with assessing to give that information. It was very minimal because of yeah. how that worked yeah. um, with how they assessed the property based on the house and the land associated with it. So I can definitely have the same conversation with the Dillons and so they know what they're getting into. Yeah, and if I could be clear, I'm not looking to penalize them by yeah. any stretch of yeah. the imagination. Yeah. I just want to make sure that it's clear to the public that, that there is an impact on the tax rolls, even if it is minimal. It, mm -hmm. It's not being given away without any implication or any impact. So I appreciate that, that explanation. Any other questions for staff? Any comments from council? Not seeing any, moving the question, all in favor? One, two, three, that's unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-115, act on the request to authorize the town manager to sell property <coughs> located at 246 US Route 1, map U4, lot 56, and 9 Fairfield Drive, map U4, lot 66, through public sale in the best and most expedient method of sale, and return on the sale for the town for the town in the discretion of the town manager, including authorization for the town manager to execute and deliver all necessary documents to enter into a purchase and sale agreement, and two, to oversee the exact terms and conditions of such sale, the completion of the sale subject to final approval by the town council, as recommended by the town manager. Is there anybody that would like to speak on the item? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or uh, presentations from the manager? Yes, um, it may surprise some for this to be before the council so quickly, but uh, I really was interested in advancing this for two reasons. One, as you well know, we are counting on proceeds of sale of this, uh, these lots uh, to go to get toward the construction, and it's uncertain to me as to how long uh, this might be on the market. So we thought it would be important to put it out there and start this process. Uh, obviously, if, if it happens quickly, uh, we'll need to negotiate as part of the transaction uh, lease back provision to make sure we can uh, stay on the premises uh, for as long as we need. And that's really why this motion was worded to allow me to enter into a purchase and sale agreement um, and really bring back to you a complete deal, uh, whether it's a straight up sale, and really clean, or it has a number of different uh, uh, components associated. Um, the other thing I'll just mention, we talk at some length at the staff level whether we should pursue maybe a non-traditional approach of uh, soliciting RFPs. Uh, and we really thought that the value here was to maximize value, not to attach certain strings and conditions. And I guess the final piece of that is that uh, staff has comfort that uh, the conversation presumably has already occurred that the land use, the underlying zoning will dictate what can happen there. And presumably we're okay conceptually with uh, the permitted uses we don't need to have further um, attach further conditions as to what uh, can or can't happen there. Council Chiazzo. Um, so I, I actually, and I, I apologize, I was, I was unaware we actually owned nine as well. Um, is that a residential house right now? We, we demolished that home. So it's, okay. uh, it appears to be part of the parcel, but it's a separate lot. So I, I, need, I want to be clear, we'll need to market them and sell them separately, separately deeded. Does it make sense or from a commercial standpoint for us to, are they zoned differently? Are they a contiguous zone? Does it make sense to include it into one? Will we get better market return if we include that as one parcel instead of two? Do we need to act on that? Well, uh, presumably a new buyer will merge the deeds and do what they wish. Um, we, could, we could do that if, if you'd like. The zone boundary does kind of bisect the larger lot, and so okay. they are different zones at this point. It is conceivable that a potential buyer, there could be two independent buyers, um, theoretically. So it may be of some value to keep them as separate, but offer them at the same time. Okay. I, I think just from a flexibility standpoint, I certainly would be willing personally to entertain if zoning changes to those, those properties need to happen in order to uh, uh, facilitate a sale, then I think I would certainly be open to that. 
It strikes me if a, if a uh, if the ultimate user wishes to use them both, they will merge the yep. the two, and yep. I think it may be to our benefit to keep as many options open right now. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the uh, the council or manager? Not seeing any. All in favor of the motion, and that is unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to order number 17-116, it's act on the request to certify the results of the municipal elections that were held on Tuesday, November 7th, 2017. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak? Not seeing any, close the public comments. And in the form of a motion, I'm going to read the document that the clerk has provided us uh, for the record. Presented for certification by the town council are the election results for the municipal elections that were held on Tuesday, November 9th, 2017. For Town Council, Sean Baybine, 2,929, was declared a winner. Jean Marie Katarina, with 3,185 votes, was declared a winner. Timothy Downs, 2,142. Peter Hayes, 3,340, was declared a winner. Ben Howard, with 1,838. Kate St. Clair, 2,497. For the Board of Education, Rebel Douglas, 1,634. Hillary Durgan, 2,928, was declared a winner. Leanne Casalionis, with 2,722 votes, was declared a winner. Christy McNally, with 2,365 votes. For sorry. Oh, there's two Board of Education, sorry. Uh, trustees for the Sanitary District, Charles Andresen, with 3,179 votes, was declared a winner. Judith Cavallero, with 3,006 votes, was declared a winner. Jason Greenleaf, 3,702 votes, was declared a winner. And Robert McSorley, with 2,842. Question number one on the Public Safety Building, the yes votes were 3,466. No votes were 3,000. The yes votes passed. There are approximately 16,749 active voters on our voter registration list for this election. <clears throat> Excuse me. It does not include same-day registrations. There were 6,666 voters. Yes, that is accurate. Who cast ballots in the November 7th election. There were 2,117 absentee ballots issued, of which 1,999 were returned. The percentage for voter turnout for this election was 40%. Pursuant to Section 206, induction of the town council, induction of council into office, councilors elect shall be sworn to the faithful discharge of their duties by the town clerk, or the town clerk's designee, and shall assume their duties at the commencement of the second meeting, whether regular, special, or emergency of the town council following the regular town election. That was amended November 7, 2000, and effective January 1, 2001. Therefore, the newly elected officials will be sworn in on Wednesday, December 6, 2017. And at this meeting, a new council chair and vice chair will be elected. Um, and I already mentioned the winners um, in each of those categories. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Any comments or questions from council? Not seeing any. All in favor? <laughs> oh, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> Councilor Foley? Uh, I would just say congratulations to those declared winners, and uh, but thank you to all who participated in the process because without a willingness to put yourself out there and be involved, it doesn't work. So um, well done by everyone. Thank you. Any other comments? I just want to point out an interesting phenomenon. I think in the last four years of all elections, special in general, uh, we have been firmly over 50% of ballots cast by absentee. And so this year, going into Election Day, we are just under 2,000 ab by absentee, and so that would suggest uh, a much lower turnout. So surprisingly, uh, we had a, a really a banner turnout on Election mm. Day. Um, not sure what brought them out, but it, it kind of defies our current trending. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Uh, moving on to standing and special committee reports, Councilor Chiazzo. Uh, so long-range planning did meet last week. Um, we uh, discussed the comprehensive plan is kind of, I don't want to say it's in limbo, but we're in a kind of a quiet phase right now as the consultants do their yeoman's work, assembling all the data that they've collected, uh, and we'll be bringing something forward to us fairly soon. We discussed a lot of, uh, fairly soon, actually, with probably within a month or two. Um, we, we discussed um, possible outreach. Um, the long-range planning has a very... Um, very uh, strong de de desire to stay in front of the council 
and, and, and report back as frequently as we possibly can because this is obviously a once in a 10 year cycle and we want to make sure that um, they want to make sure that uh, everybody participates and we get they get the full breadth of council support so they're very interested in reporting back so I think maybe next year we can look at um, dedicating uh, some time for long-range planning uh, comprehensive plan updates and, and uh, I think the long-range planning committee would certainly welcome that and be happy to liaise with that um, transportation hasn't met yet but I think we're, we're, we're due very soon so thank you council Hayes yeah, just two, just some quick updates. Both Coastal Harbor and Shellfish Commissions are sort of in states of transition, so there's not much to update, um, but I will. We'll, we'll get there. Um, and then the Finance Committee, I did mention, we, we did meet, we did talk about, we're, we're working on the new sort of debt policy. We also talked about the, the bond refunding we talked about tonight. Um, there is interest in, I think, you know, the joint Finance committee meetings have an interest in continuing the work, so we're looking for some dates to start getting together and to continue the conversations we started tonight about a process and other things. So I think with that, that's some updates from this end. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Foley? Uh, yes, yeah, so the Conservation Commission did meet on Monday. Unfortunately, my vehicle didn't cooperate and uh, my car did not make it there with me or in it. So um, I don't have an update from them, but I do know that they were uh, reviewing their uh, work for the comp plan as well. That was a big part of uh, that meeting. Um, Eastern Trail Alliance, to answer uh, Councilor Chiazzo's question from earlier, they are not there yet in terms of closing the gap, but they are uh, feeling the momentum they're underneath that last kind of $400,000 range and feeling like they want to, they're going to get there. They're going to keep pushing through. Uh, and then lastly, rules and policy did meet yesterday. Um, two points of discussion, uh, one which I'll ask Tom to mm -hmm. perhaps weigh in. Uh, so at our previous rules and policy committee meeting, I had brought up the concern or issue around trying to get budget materials in advance of first reading just to allow councilors time before they vote for the first time uh, on the budget that it's their first glance that night so we recognize the, the committee recognized that it didn't necessarily it wasn't really a rule or policy per se um, more of a best practice uh, to see if that could happen and, and uh, the town manager was very helpful in trying to put together a timeline that might uh, serve that so you want to give them a quick just yeah I think you've, you've really introduced it, it. Um, I'm on schedule as I normally uh, am to, to present the budget at the first meeting in April that'd be your first Wednesday uh, the tradition has been to do presentation and first reading that same evening but given some of the concerns um, I think we'll stick with certainly presentation on that to stay on our normal schedule uh, what that would require is perhaps a special meeting perhaps the second uh, Wednesday of the month uh, work with council chair uh, to coordinate those details I would see that as a single item agenda is uh, uh, focused specifically on the budget and its first reading uh, and then the second piece that we discussed at rules of policy was the uh, section 200.8 the council's policy on political activities uh, it was a positive conversation um, from my perspective anyway and it ultimately kind of demonstrated that there are in fact a variety of different views on that policy um, and so depending on the will of the council really there are many choices or options to take um, we could do nothing we could uh, eliminate the policy altogether we could uh, have it discussed as a full council in a workshop potentially maybe after the holidays um, to give everybody a little bit of a, some breathing room or it could be sent back to rules and policy uh, to kind of vet through and work on some suggested edits and additions um, but we didn't feel it was prudent until since there will be a new committee probably put in place uh, once the new councils together it wasn't prudent for us to move forward with anything uh, specific at that time the one thing that did occur to me and, and that came up during that conversation as well is that this policy actually was not uh, vetted through uh, the town's legal uh, department and that would be to me it would seem prudent that we should have an attorney uh, take a look at it um, just to give offer some advice on where it is so that was it for me for committees council Rowan thank you um, historic preservation implementation committee met last week um, the highlight of the meeting was we had a, a lengthy discussion about um, the Beechridge schoolhouse um, I spoke to several of you about this um, 
um, over the last year or so. Um, but um, um, but the uh, Brian Dobson from the assessor's office was able to get in there, or uh, code enforcement office was able to get in there and actually take a look at uh, the building um, and found um, um, some aspects of it were uh, with some of the members of that committee. Um, the finding was pretty much that there were some problems with some of the foundation. Um, there were some um, uh, parts of the building that was open to the elements, um, but in general, the building was structurally sound. Um, it, this is a, um, a remnant of Scarborough's um, history in which there are still um, people living in town today, probably hundreds of people still living in town today that actually went to school in a one-room one schoolhouse um, um, in the early part of the century, or last century. Um, and uh, if we are going to do something about it, we need to do something about it um, fairly quickly. Um, and uh, that would involve some kind of investment. So um, it's something to keep in mind um, as we go around. I think there's, there's definitely historic value in preserving this building, um, and it's something that we should consider. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Donovan. Uh, uh, Tuesday, the Metro Regional Coalition met, part of GP COG. Uh, we are really at the beginning of a new uh, year as the council here is approaching a new year, uh, focusing on uh, uh, what issues can be addressed really regionally, uh, what sort of assistance can GP COG be. Marijuana is one of the issues in which I think they can both be an advocate uh, 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 in uh, Augusta, as well as a source of information for the seven communities, actually 22 communities that make up GPCOG. The other issue that we're going to focus on uh, this year is homelessness. Uh, it, is, um, it is a painful subject to talk about, I will tell you. Uh, the uh, report that we were given uh, on Tuesday said that there are 6,300 homeless people in Maine, 2,700 in Portland, uh, and that breaks out about a third, a third, a third. A third of them are from Portland. A third of them are from around the state, and a third of them are from outside the state, uh, a number of which are from foreign countries. Uh, and it was interesting to hear uh, the uh, city of Portland people do bear an undue burden on this, uh, uh, and they, uh, they're they're great about it. They really go about the business. If we could get some support in Augusta for them, uh, it would be uh, tremendous. Uh, they talk so uh, favorably about uh, some of the African countries uh, and the members of the uh, communities, Congo, uh, Somali Somalis, who would help get homeless people off the street because there just aren't, otherwise you're sleeping on a mat. And a, on, a, on a basement floor, uh, on a, just a cold floor. So uh, that was interesting. Um, we're going to look at regional solutions. Uh, the one that is almost obvious from a Cape, South Portland, Scarborough, Falmouth, Yarmouth point of view is workforce housing. Because what happens is the slippery slope of uh, going downhill, suffering mental illness, uh, uh, the, the real goal is to be able to have people who might only be earning in their, the 20,000s or 30,000s to be able to have a good place to live. And Huston Commons was a, a terrific, and the they, Avesta, of course, is, is a, a great contributor to the community. So that was, uh, uh, that was helpful. Uh, GP Cog put on a forum on marijuana uh, a week before last, uh, noting the it's, it's really the lack of a tight regulatory scheme, the dangers that we're facing, uh, and we really have to implore our our uh, representatives in Augusta to come up with a solution so that uh, marijuana can have uh, a regulatory framework uh, that uh, that will control it. A uh, number of towns have banned uh, marijuana sales, uh, and uh, there's some interesting maps that are online uh, that will show you that. But uh, uh, just last week, Cape Elizabeth uh, passed uh, a ban on the sale of uh, marijuana products. Uh, again, they did not favor, as, as Scarborough did not favor the adoption of this, 
and the, the glib comment was made, thank goodness for South Portland, <laughs> who, who has embraced this, uh, 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 said in humor, but uh, with some element of truth. I think that's it for the reports. Thank you. Great. Um, as chair, I do want to give a final report. Um, uh, nothing specific to any particular activity except for um, I've had a bad back, as everybody knows, for many years. And so I've been on my back, actually, the last couple of days, and I was bored. Actually, literally went through and read all of our minutes from the past year and took down some statistics. Um, tells you how uh, boring I am when I'm sick. When you're but I sad. think, it, yeah, when I'm sick, yeah. Just imagine how boring I am when I'm healthy. <laughs> um, and I thought I wanted to share some of that because I think it lends to the conversations that we've had over time regarding our goals and what we have achieved over the past year. Uh, the town council had 38 meetings and 11 workshops. Our quickest meeting was 13 minutes, which was on August 8th. Our longest was three hours and 27 minutes the following week on August 16th. Um, there are 215 actual votes cast. And this is the part that's surprising because over the year, I remember hearing from one of the communications forum that somehow there is this network of uh, of um, whomever and that there's a lot of divisiveness on the council and our votes. 95% of our votes were in a majority of five, or two, five to two or better. 90% of them were six to one or better and 87% was unanimous in all of our votes. Only nine times was the vote cast that was either four to three or three to four in which something was very close. Six of those related to amendments that were related to either stickers on trash cans <laughs> or zoning for the Enterprise Park and Haggis, Park, uh, Haggis Parkway um, issue that came up regarding the self-storage building. And one was regarded um, a tabling motion. Only one main motion failed, only to come back in the following week and actually pass. Um, one clear piece is that 100% of the time we agreed to pass our minutes and to adjourn. <laughs> so um, that was, I thought that was kind of uh, interesting. And by the way, in the total time when I uh, posted, we did a, a total number of hours, and this is just at council meetings, was 80, 88 hours and 18 minutes that we spent together in these chambers, not including the work that we do on our own committees. So I think that as we look, um, one exercise that we weren't able to complete was a follow-up regarding our goals. But I hope at the very least that you go back and take a look at the goals and how you rank them and look at the work that we've done. One of the things that I wanted to do, but I really started to get boring with my own boredness, uh, was I wanted to take down a list of all the topics that we considered. Um, you can do that on your own, and I hope that you <laughs> take that into consideration when you look at our success, because I think that this council has been very successful. Um, as chair, I want to thank uh, Councilor St. Clair as well um, for being vice chair. She had done a stellar work in getting the communications committee started um, and off the ground running, which was a major, major accomplishment that we wanted. So I wish her the best of luck as well. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to the town manager for his report. Yes, thank you. I've got a few items just to brief uh, the council and the public on. Uh, the LED streetlight project, this is a project the Energy Committee has taken on um, very gladly. Uh, we're progressing very well. We've actually awarded a contract to a company called TEN, the Efficiency Network. Uh, incidentally, they're the company that uh, the City of Portland has contracted with for similar work. Uh, so we're in the process of negotiating a contract with them. Following that, I expect we'll be moving quickly into, and this is really at the staff level, uh, uh, an outreach plan. We want to make sure that residents understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. I think part of that, we're going to revisit the uh, return on investment. There's a, a very um, important bottom line argument that I think uh, was persuasive to members of council. I just want to make sure the public understands that as well. Um, this project is going to pick up speed fairly quickly in that we expect to start the work in the spring and it's going to take three to four weeks to complete. Uh, they're going to have uh, kind of armies of trucks all over town switching out uh, the fixtures. Um, as part of the advanced work, we are doing a, a full inventory of existing lights to make sure that they're all necessary and meet our current policies. Uh, there may be opportunities to add additional lights, but at expense, I might add. Um, so we're pleased to have that project moving. Um, last week, there were oral arguments heard in the tax appeal cases. Councilor Donovan uh, and staff uh, attended that. Um, interestingly, I think the uh, Justice Horton gave uh, an hour for the proceeding. It went nearly two and a half hours, which suggests a level of interest on his part. 
Uh, there was certainly spirited dis discussion and conversation around the finer points. Um, we don't know for certain, but we expect a ruling certainly in the next couple of months. In fact, I think Justice Horton um, suggested that he had uh, it partially drafted before oral arguments. So uh, things are moving forward, and I'll keep you abreast. I'm pleased to provide an update on the assessing department. This has been uh, a real challenge for me for a long time. Uh, we've had a number of changes and no long-term consistency in that office. Um, I have extended an offer to uh, David Buffard. Dave Buffard uh, formerly uh, was the assistant assessor here before Sue Russo took the position. Mm -hmm. And since then, he's worked at Maine Revenue uh, in the property tax division. And uh, we've been successful in retaining Sue, keeping her on. Uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a collaborative approach uh, because the one thing that I, I know for certain is I don't want to repeat this again in a few years. Uh, Dave is of the age he's retiring from the state. He's pleased to work here a bit, but he's not going to be here forever. And so a real important part of this going forward is to make sure that we're ready for the next step when that comes. Uh, it's astounding uh, with the shortage of qualified assessors uh, in the state. If anyone's looking for a career path, uh, there's <laughs> going to be some opportunity, I assure you. Um, also good news, uh, we did get health insurance rates in. Uh, for those on finance and others paying attention, we had estimated as much as a 15% increase in health insurance rates. Uh, for the majority of staff, they came in at 5% and for the rest at 9%. So that produces uh, about a $65,000 savings to the bottom line when you add it up. So certainly good news there. And two last things. Uh, Wreaths Across America, this is a program that's been going on for some time. Scarborough will be an official stop this year. Uh, this, at the high school, uh, the superintendent has been coordinating with them. Uh, that will occur on December 11th. I think there'll be all sorts of publicity around that event, uh, but do put that down. And Santa in the Park, which is a town-sponsored event, will be Saturday, December 2, here at Memorial Park from 5 to 6.30, and certainly encourage folks to come to that. And lastly, I, I, I do want to recognize Councilor St. Clair. Um, we've had the occasion to work together during her time, entire time on Council, and I certainly always appreciated her good humor and her interesting perspective on issues. Um, she had a lot of stuff, challenging things in her personal life and made every effort to contribute to the council. Um, and I, I very much admire that about her. Thank you. With that, council member comments, council Donovan. Yeah, the property tax appeals, uh, it was a long argument, but uh, uh, it's a very difficult area of the law. Uh, and if you sat there and listened to it, you would understand the complexity that's involved. Uh, there is no uh, precedent on all fours that would allow the court to simply say, well, this is how we do it. There are other cases in, in which uh, it was found there was a discriminatory element involved, but they all get treated differently. And the Maine Supreme Court gave very little guidance uh, uh, to uh, the Board of Assessment Review. Board of Assessment Review, uh, uh, I think, did a good job. Uh, and now it's in the hands of the judge, and we'll see what happens. Uh, last Friday night uh, was a bitter cold night, and I decided I'd make that the, my first Scarborough High School football game of the year. <laughs> as, as, foolish as my wife said that was uh, and of course uh, 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 we won uh, soundly it was a, a great a great performance by the Scarborough High School and that was the South Class A final uh, playing Wyndham uh, Saturday at 11 a.m. in Portland uh, we are uh, at the end of the town council year I want to thank Sean for his leadership uh, it was been outstanding we had some difficult issues uh, certainly some of the housing issues were, uh, and he did an awfully good job. Uh, congratulations to Peter and Sean and Jean Marie. Uh, we really have a very strong council going forward. Uh, this is a really, a really good group. And it's the year of the comprehensive plan. So we've really got to roll up our sleeves and work. This will be a terrific year for all of us to contribute. Thank you. Yeah, Council Rowan. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'd, I'd also like to thank you, Sean. I think you've done a great job, and I really appreciate um, your, you. your time as chair. Um, and uh, further, congratulate our councillor-elect and 
returning counselors. Uh, but I also wanted to thank um, uh, King St. Clair. Um, uh, she, you know, she she dedicated a lot of years um, to service to the town, and she was never at a loss for words. Um, and uh, I'm, we're going to miss working with her, and I really enjoyed the time. Uh, I also wanted to thank um, Kelly Murphy. Um, she also um, put in a number of years uh, of dedication on the school board, um, and um, I really appreciate the service that she put in, as well as uh, Christine Massengill, who had moved to Florida mm. earlier in the year right. recently, um, but also was retiring from the school board. So thank you to all of them. Um, I also got to go to a high school event. I went to see Singing in the Rain on Saturday. It was awesome. Uh, there were 50 kids uh, on stage tap dancing in unison and singing. And um, I had never been to, since I was in high school, to a high school production. And uh, they, this was incredibly impressive. And we're going to have to make a, a habit of going to their, their productions in the future. And I encourage others to do the same. Um, there were some comments earlier about the sign ordinance. Um, and I wanted to just point out that there was a sign ordinance in place before we made changes to it. A lot of the complaints that we've been hearing have been around things that are in the sign ordinance, around one sign on private property per lot. Um, the, you know, we cleaned up the, the issue with the banners. Uh, there, previously, you were allowed one banner plus one banner that said open uh, because we had to go to um, uh, the content neutral. We could no longer actually read the sign that said open, so we had to we just removed that, that sign. Um, um, but in general, I think the, the sign ordinance has been uh, pretty successful. I would say that, um, we, that we certainly could, um, there certainly could be sections that, that could be revisited. Um, but um, I think we should um, see, see how it works out. Um, the last thing is just that, that I hope that uh, the upcoming year we can also have a really productive year um, as a town council. Um, I think that the, the past several election cycles have really shown that um, there's a lot of division in town. Um, and I, I think that, um, that we can certainly do a lot to uh, address that and be cognizant of that. Um, and that, that um, I'd really like to see us continue to strive to include um, in minority viewpoints on the council and, and, and really try and be inclusive um, in our governing policy and, uh, and not try and, and push for um, you know, narrow votes. I think the statistics that Sean read were, were terrific, and I think we should <coughs> continue to, uh, to work along that venue. But thank you. Thank you, Councilor Foley. Um, everyone keeps saying all the things I was going to say, so I don't know. Uh, I think the biggest thing is uh, my favorite holiday of the year is coming up, uh, even more than Christmas. I really uh, I love Thanksgiving because it's not about giving gifts, it's about being together and being with your family, and that's uh, some, that's a huge thing for me. A lot of you know, I think, because I shared gratitude beads with you, I have a daily gratitude practice, and so uh, I guess I just, this year for Thanksgiving, I would say, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve the town. Um, it's not always easy. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of time, um, but it is, uh, it, it's a privilege and one that I am grateful for. So I uh, hope everybody out there has opportunity to spend time with loved ones over the holiday, be safe, um, uh, but enjoy that time together because that's what this holiday is about. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just a couple quick things. One, just thank everybody for coming out to vote this time. The, the statistics of how many did show up on an off year election is great. Thanks for the public <coughs> safety building and supporting that. Congratulations to the to the new members of the council, Jean Marie and, and Sean. Well, not new members, but <laughs> elected members. Um, similarly, thanks for your leadership this year, Sean. Um, and for me, I guess I'll just kind of leave it. Um, you know, tonight to the right of me is where Kate St. Clair said. I've actually sat next to her for three years and really kind of feeling sort of that empty spot tonight. Um, just thank her for all her service and all her passion. Um, she really did care about the town and the community. Um, so I thank her for the, I think she was on the council six years. Is that about right? Two terms. Five, five. years. Five years. So just really a shout out to her, a big thanks, and thanks everybody for supporting us. And look forward to the coming year. How's Chiazzo? So um, I, I, I do have a couple of things from the election cycle that I do want to point out. Um, and I, I won't dwell on them, um, but there were a, a couple of disturbing issues that I found um, extremely troublesome this cycle, more so than I've ever seen before in town. Um, one was the, the, the vandalism or theft of a sign on public property, or private property, excuse me, that was pretty blatant. Um, second one hit a little closer to home to me, and uh, somebody defaced a sign that was underneath the mailbox that had my family name on it. 
Um, it was extremely disturbing to both me and my family, and um, I, I'm not usually one to, to take personal offense at things. As a, an elected official and someone sits behind here, you have to listen to everybody and you get a pretty thick skin, but I did think that was a, a, a tad much even for Scarborough. So um, I, I, I'm not leveling accusations. I don't know who it was. I don't know where it came from, um, but I just really hope that we can collectively as a town um, you know, just take some of that nastiness and bitterness out of this process some way, somehow. I mean, you know, we're all we're all trying to do the best we can for the the best we can in town and for everybody. So, um, I hope that doesn't continue. Certainly was disturbing, but um, but it's done, and uh, hopefully we can move past that and move forward. On a positive note, um, I do want to say congratulations to everybody who was successful. Uh, and I also want to say congratulations to all those who weren't successful. It takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there and stick to your values and, and, um, and, and, and really make a commitment. And there are very few of us, even sitting behind this table, who haven't lost an election before. And I think it's a true testament of, of, of your passion and your character to hopefully pick yourself up and dust yourself off and, and continue moving forward because if you really are passionate about it, I know everybody who, who ran was, um, that you, you stick to it and you keep at it because it, it, is a, it is an honor and a privilege to serve the town. And even if you're unsuccessful, I think you should take solace in knowing that several thousand people agreed with you uh, and that you were, you were the right person for them. So um, it's certainly easy to build off of that or, or, or sh something should be built off of. Um, I also want to say um, I, I am going to miss Kate. Um, she, she and I are, are almost opposite extremes. I'm cold and unemotional, and she's very passionate and emotional, and I think that balance is wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm hoping uh, Jean Marie could maybe feel some of that passion, but not too much. Um, <laughs> but I, I do have the utmost respect for her and her service to this town, and I know she served the town well to the... Uh, uh, to, to the best of her abilities, and, I, and I, I, I do hope that we haven't seen the last of her for sure. And I hope she stays engaged with the process, and, and certainly I, I, um, I do wish her the best. I know it's, you know, as much as we like to be here, it's great to have family time again, and, and, and I hope she can make the best of that. But I do want to wish, um, wish her the best moving forward. And, um, yeah, next year is, is going to be a... a a very challenging year. I'm very grateful to this whole council and the new council, or G. Marie, really kind of the only person coming in. We've got a lot of consistency now. We have a lot of good skill sets here, and I think we can really be productive and and move the town in the right direction. And I think we're we're very well positioned for success next year. So I look forward to to participating in that and and um, you know hopefully getting to better outcomes next year for sure. Can I just add, add something? I, last night, I, I, I failed to mention, but it's actually, I, I was really blown away. Last night was the National Honor Society inducting kids in. I think there were 80 kids or so, something like that, inducted last night. Uh. And each kid got an introduction by a friend or someone else. And I tell you, we have some incredible kids in this community. That Every single kid, the number of hours they put into community service, volunteering at Maine Medical Center and some other things, these kids are really, really exceptional so our system really is producing some well-rounded kids and it's really interesting even even some of the captains of our sports team were playing musical instruments they were doing debate they really diverse really well-rounded i was just blown away every kid that got up there i said wow this we're doing something right in our community so i just wanted to to share that thank you thank you um some final comments uh first is um I really want to say thank you to my um, fellow counselors um, for the opportunity to having served this past year as chair. Um, I think someone said then and even now says, uh, be careful what you wish for. Um, but it truly was an experience. It provided me an opportunity for me to do some um, internalization and kind of self-evaluation about my um, approach to politics in the sense that um, in this position, it's, it's not about your personal views or your positions. It's about the position that you hold and trying to provide a balance for everyone um, and being respectful in that, um, even though you might be principled and really just want to stand on top of one of these desks and scream sometimes. Um, I hope I did that balancing act um, uh, well enough for you. I hope I was respectful. Um, 
while at the same time having disagreement that um, was productive uh, for the conversation. But I do want to say thank you. Um, I'll be honest with you. At first, I was like, ah, oh, Bill's front-loading me with all these things that could have been taken care of last year but are being put on my plate. But I think that maybe it was the right person at the right time because we got through it all and had a very good time doing it and was very, very productive in, in everything that we've done. So I, I do want to say thank you. I, I especially want to thank Kate Sinclair uh, for her service. You know, one of, the, um, one of the groups that I belong to has a uh, motto of service above self and to serve on the town council. It is truly about serving everyone else in this community, um, and often forgetting yourself. And so she has done that steadily. It was nice having her beside me as vice chair. Um, and I want to uh, wish her the best of luck. I think if anything, she's the real winner because now she can be home with all of her lovely children um, and spend time with them. So good luck to Kate. Um, sorry, I've got all kinds of notes here. Um, also want to, um, oh, sorry. Um, so tonight, um, it's unfortunate that we had to start off tonight with the situation in which one of our public speakers had to um, uh, be escorted um, and arrested um, for his conduct. And I hope people understand, and I'm embarrassed by it because we did have some young people in the audience that are a part of the Eagles, or a part of the Boy Scouts, and if anything, this is a lesson on democracy. But the fact is, is that um, we are very clear in how we um, want our community to be, and that clearness is that um, we are respectful to each other. We can have disagreement, and it's not the content of his remarks, it's the context in which he delivered it. And it was obvious that that context was to be disruptive, um, and I felt it necessary because I think not only was it disruptive, I became nervous and thought it might even turn um, and be harmful. So um, I apologize in the sense that it happened, but it's not my fault that he did that. He chose to do it and to be that way. So um, to the young men that were here, um, I don't want anyone to be distracted by the great presentation that you gave because it was a wonderful project. Um, our cemeteries are very important. Um, it's a big part of the community. We have a budget line item that's specific towards maintaining um, um, our, um, our cemeteries. So the fact that they found this and took care of it so well um, should be commended. Um, it's just wonderful to see. Um, last, um, not last, uh, one other item I did want to mention was regarding the signs. Um, I was going to um, actually make the correction when the comment was made because um, I will point blank state, um, obviously the comments were directed at me because I'm the one that had the signs. Um, and I want to make sure it's clear. The town clerk has confirmed that every sign that was put up was in compliance. If it was not out of compliance, it was put into compliance. And it was confirmed by her office as well as the code enforcement. So any context in which it remained out of compliance is a that out lie, it's not accurate. And they were communicated with the people that asked. So um, I want people to know that when a mistake was made, it was corrected and it was done so by every candidate and every person that had a sign, because it wasn't just me. Um, and with that, um, I did also want to mention um, some thank yous in a way, um, but also some apologies. I really want to thank Mark and Terry Maroon. Um, Council Chiazzo mentioned um, they have been dear friends of the family. Uh, my wife, longer for about 35 years. Um, if you don't know, Mark is the chairman of the CBA. He also is the owner of the, um, the building on Willowdale and Route 1. Um, I had some signs that were placed out there, not the paper signs that are kind of ridiculous in the sense that they're not that costly. But these were the big signs that they cost me $500. And someone stole them. It's sad, but someone stole it. Um, if they had asked, because if they wanted it because of the whiteboard content, I probably would have donated and given it to them. Uh, but I want to thank Mark and Terry and apologize that they had to go through that because I know it's hard as friends. I also want to say um, my apologies to Chris and his family because um, it was my sign that someone took and they spread feces on it and threw it in his yard. And if this is what Scarborough has come to, then we should all be embarrassed. And then to top that off, in our yard on one Sunday, my wife walks out and friends who came to the house, we find an entire box of drywall screws thrown in our driveway. That is not what this community is about. And while I might not know who did it, the fact is that there's people in this town that I know did not do it. And there's people in this town that I question whether or not they were part of that. I hope I'm wrong. Maybe it was somebody from a different town, but I doubt it. But this has got to change. It has got to change. And um, with that, I wanna say thank you very much to this community for giving me another term. 
Um, at the end, this will count as 17 years, and I love every time I do this. I, I post on my Facebook that I get another chance to do what I love, and that is uh, serving our community. And I know that you all do as well. And to Jean Marie, congratulations and welcome back. I know you're going to hit the road running, um, which is great. And uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Thank you.